Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the May 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of the IWW Organizing Manual by the Industrial Workers of the World Labor Union from 1996. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So if you're interested in learning how to organize a labor union in your workplace, this would be a good file for you to listen to. I personally have used techniques similar to those described in this manual in a number of workplaces. The thing is, organizing is pretty difficult, or at least it can be, and I would say it usually is. That is at least taking a completely unorganized workplace from scratch all the way to full union recognition. That's quite a process. However, even if you fall somewhat short of that goal, you can still sometimes form at least what is sometimes called a minority union in your workplace. That is, you can at least get some of the coworkers and you organize to help each other out. The entire idea of this is shifting the balance of power in the workplace away from the owner and their managers and towards the workers. How far exactly you can move that balance of power is up to a lot of different circumstances. One thing that you may find, for example, if you try to apply some of the techniques that you'll learn in this file in the real world, is that a lot of people are not shy about complaining about conditions. But when it comes to being asked to take that next step, they're not always willing to actually go there. Talk is one thing and action is another. I remember one workplace I was at, and it really wasn't just the one, but there was one in particular where... I mean, people would spend a good chunk of the day just complaining about the management. And then after months of this, when I suggested certain actions, you know, and I knew who was really on board with this and who was more indifferent or lukewarm, and I had some one-on-ones and was encouraging, you know, hey, maybe we should uh, go the next step. Nobody wanted to do it. I mean, literally not a one. After that, people would still stand around complaining for large chunks of time, but I knew that they were all cowards. Now, that's not to overly judge them, but the fact is, had they taken action, they might have been able to change some of these circumstances rather than just having people, you know, coming in and out on a revolving door pretty much every month. You know, the turnover was just crazy. So, you know, even the most talented organizer, not saying that I'm the most talented organizer, but even if you do everything right, in other words, uh, there's a lot of circumstances that are just beyond your control. This involves, you know, a group of people, not just you. So it doesn't really matter just what you alone think. It really matters what everyone thinks and what everyone wants to do. As an organizer, what you're basically doing is bringing people together for a particular goal. You may be suggesting the particular goal of you know, getting together and standing together against the boss for particular, you know, workplace gains, whatever your particular situation calls for, whatever conditions, you know, first need to be changed, whatever the priority is. But the people that you're bringing together are people. They're messy and complicated and everybody brings a lot of baggage with them. You're not personally responsible as an organizer for them having acquired that baggage that they're bringing to this workplace union, but you do have to work with it. And sometimes the people there are sturdy stuff and they're determined and they're willing to stand strong in the face of employer intimidation and all the other things that you're going to encounter during a union drive, a union campaign. And sometimes they aren't, you know, and that's just the way that it is. You can either wait for turnover to happen and then, you know, maybe there will be an influx of new coworkers that, you know, you can then size up after a certain amount of time and see if they might be more willing. But the point is, you know, you can have a master sculptor, you can have Michelangelo, really talented artist, you know, tremendous vision, and given the right materials can make something extraordinary. But given the wrong materials, the thing is just not going to hold together. That's just the physics of it. It's kind of like a workplace union. It's only as strong as the members of it. So, you know, this is why as socialists, we want to try to change the culture and increase the general level of class consciousness and, you know, that sort of willingness, creating a culture in the 
society at large of you know resentment of the exploitation by capitalists of the working class and all that kind of stuff so that people aren't you know so prone to lick the boot you find out when you're in a situation like this where jobs are on the line and all that kind of stuff it really matters what people think and what their values are in terms of you know do they worship capitalists do they view them as quote job creators do they think that the workers should just be grateful and feel blessed to have jobs at all you know it's those kinds of attitudes that you're going to be coming up against from time to time as an organizer and i say from time to time to not psych anybody out it might be a little bit more uh, commonly encountered than you might want to experience but you got to be ready for it and anyway that's why we're trying to change the culture because when it comes down to the micro level like this it can really make a difference so anyway those are some of my introductory comments there's a lot of detail in this manual so let's just go ahead and get into it so this is the IWW organizing manual by the industrial workers of the world or the wobblies as they're sometimes known we have a documentary about their early history they were founded in 1905 up on the channel they are a radical revolutionary labor union revolutionary in the sense that they weren't just founded to seek better conditions and better pay but also to end capitalism in the short term they seek better conditions and in the long term they seek to abolish capitalism now the IWW has been subject to a lot of government persecution I mean, over a hundred years ago, they experienced some really heavy raids, and the Union was not only harmed by that, but also by internal ideological splits, whether to support a socialist party or not, and what was their stance on anarchism, for example. So the Union had ups and downs over the years, like with the rest of the labor movement. In the late 50s, it suffered extreme losses of membership, and it has sort of persisted on and like many things in the left today in the United States in the sort of post occupy era it has experienced something of a bounce back I would say that today it is strongly influenced by anarchist ideology this is a Marxist channel and that's not really something that we support I think that anarchism though there's many fine anarchists out there Anarchism is a very flawed ideology for a number of reasons that we discuss in other videos. So I think that that doesn't necessarily help the union. That said, I think also anything that we can do to get the labor movement going again and just build up some mass organizations where average working people are organized is a really important thing. So it's important to learn techniques like this, whether or not you're going to join this particular labor union. Nothing sharpens class consciousness like engaging directly in struggle. We obviously support reading history and theory as well because theory is distilled history and history is applied theory. So you got to read that too. But knowing the actual micro level techniques of struggling at your job and in other places where you face class exploitation, this is really key. You know, it doesn't involve what your take is on China or this or that. It involves talking to people and trying to bring people together to struggle collectively. So quite a different thing than the very online stuff that a lot of people do. So let's continue. This second edition of the IWW's organizing manual builds upon the first edition, published in 1978. This edition was published in May 1996, after a draft was circulated to the entire IWW membership for comments. It is a collective product, incorporating large sections of the 1978 edition and suggestions from dozens of Wobblies. This manual is prepared primarily for workers in the United States. While much of the discussion may be useful to workers in other countries, the legal restrictions imposed vary dramatically from country to country. For example, many countries do not have the winner-take-all system of union representation elections that are found in the U.S. Instead, every union with a presence in the workplace is entitled to represent its members. Obviously, union organizing strategies will differ with conditions. Part 1. The Organizer What is organizing? Organizing is the process by which a group of people take power over some aspect of their lives, on the job or in their communities. While community struggles are important in their own right, 
This organizing manual concentrates on organizing our fellow workers in the workplace, where we, as workers, have the industrial power to enforce our demands. Too often, organizing is viewed as leaders selling an external agency to workers to, quote, represent them. A vast body of law and huge bureaucracies exist to reinforce such notions, but this is not what our organizing is all about. IWW organizing aims at enabling a group of working people to build a union and use it to express their needs and desire and to accomplish the changes they want to make in their economic lives. The important consideration is their needs and their lives. The organizer simply makes the tools available to them. The union is the people in it. If it is not, it won't be worth the trouble of fighting for, and it will be abandoned at the first pressure. The basic feelings most working people share, that make the union their natural tool, are already there. Class consciousness, the conviction that their interests are not identical with their employers, alienation from jobs they see as unrewarding and or useless, self-respect that's outraged by the conditions of their work or the attitudes of their superiors. Organizing involves first understanding these working people, as they are now, and then giving them information that they need in order to be able to figure out how a union can meet their needs. The understanding is the important part. A class-conscious working class. For many, working class has become a dirty word since the 1930s. Paternalistic liberals try to define the working class out of existence by assigning workers above the poverty line to the middle class and the rest to an underclass to become objects of government, quote, benevolence. Part of the elitist left likewise tries to deny that wage workers are a class-conscious, potentially revolutionary class, and many left political parties identify class consciousness with acceptance of their party line. Establishment academics and politicians try to hide the working class in an amorphous middle class. None of these opinions changes reality. The potential for a class-conscious working class exists because capitalist production exploits wage workers. Class consciousness depends not on labels and revolutionary rhetoric, but on the fact of oppression and each worker's awareness of their own individual exploitation. The intensity and breadth of working class struggle depend upon the pressure of exploitation and the viability of the practical tools available for struggle. Each generation of workers learns for itself the bitter truth that, regardless of the myths and success stories they were taught in school, in reality they will not rise out of their class. The options are closed off, and they're stuck. For the next 40 years or so, they will work, assuming they can find jobs, for wages. And for most, those wages will be so modest that they will live their lives on the edge of financial disaster, only two or three paychecks from the street. For most workers, class consciousness does not extend beyond their particular employer and their immediate fellow workers. They do not connect their situation to a capitalist class, controlling a capitalist government for their enslavement. Nevertheless, every time a worker supports their fellow workers or union, any union, that worker is saying, my employer is my enemy, I must combine with my fellow workers to fight the situation. Our job as organizers is to build on that latent class consciousness, to show our fellow workers how their individual situations are fundamentally the same and result from the structure of the workplace, the economy, and the society. Only by working together, by recognizing that an injury to one is an injury to all, can we hope for substantive improvements for ourselves. Who can organize? Only class-conscious working people can organize their peers. We learn class consciousness in our blood and bones. We, each individually, learn the feel of our own particular boss's foot on our own particular neck. Without this personal experience, the knowledge in our heads is useless. Our shared work experience develops understanding impossible to acquire in any other way. If you've never felt that you simply could not stand the last hour of a shift, how can you hope to understand that feeling in others? Or endure the humiliation of a boss's bawling out because you couldn't afford to quit? Or, for that matter, faced a job you hated every day because people you cared about depended on you for support and you didn't see another job in sight? If you haven't had to make the thousand and one compromises with yourself, and the way you would like things to be, how can you possibly understand most working people who are forced to make such compromises? Any class-conscious worker can be, and should be, an organizer. The business unions and government, comment, the business unions is the IWW's term for the larger unions, which are basically 
complicit in capitalism and aren't revolutionary, etc. They just kind of like exist to collect salaries out of dues money, etc. The business unions and government have led many of us to think of organizing as a job for specialists rather than as something that we do every day on the job. The labor movement was not built by professional organizers, many of whom have never worked the jobs they're trying to organize. It was built by working people like us, who recognized that only by uniting on the job, in industry, could we hope to win better conditions and a better world. I just want to comment here also, both in the name, Industrial Workers of the World, and in phrases like that, uniting on the job in industry. Uh, this is not just to say, you know, working with heavy machinery. There are all types of industry, you know, the service industry, healthcare industry, education industry, medical industry, whatever it is, that isn't necessarily heavy machinery. Industry is a general term for the economy and workforce, where things are produced. And things here means both goods and services. Continuing. Part 2. Preparing to Organize Most IWW organizing drives start with someone on the job, perhaps someone who already holds a red card, it's an IWW membership card, and has decided that conditions are ripe to organize their fellow workers, approaching the union for help organizing their fellow workers. Sometimes workers write or call our main office and are referred to the local general membership branch, or GMB or else the local engages in activities designed to find workers interested in activism in the workplace and or organizing the place they work. Either way, you generally start off with a generally small, pre-existing base of support on the job and information about working conditions, pay rates, and other useful information, such as when shifts change, which gives you an invaluable head start on getting the organizing drive off the ground. Choosing the target. But whether the IWW is asked in by workers on the job, or you're coming in cold, it helps to do a little research on the employer and the job. Even under the best possible conditions, the chances of success are not always certain. Here are some considerations. Size is important. On a very small job, the turnover of a few people may wipe out a majority. On a very large job, organizing may be beyond our resources, and competition from other unions will likely be keen. Business unions often decline to organize small workplaces due to the relatively high cost per member of organizing and representing the workers. So workplaces with less than 50 employees should have the least competition from other unions. However, even where it isn't possible to win an IWW majority, the possibility of building a job branch to maintain a union presence on the shop floor shouldn't be overlooked. In well-organized areas, the large workplaces and those involving traditional craft skills are likely to be already organized. The leavings are small places, generally with high turnover and poor wages and conditions. Most workers in these places know that they're exploited and are planning to move along soon. So as soon as possible. We all know that feeling. They might organize if they can be convinced that they have a reasonable chance of success. Researching the target. The employer's financial condition and competitive position will affect the chances of raising wages and improving conditions. The strongest union can't get much in the way of pay hikes from a marginal employer in an unprofitable enterprise, though a direct action campaign may well be able to do something about the conditions. Comment that would be schedule, treatment, whatever it is. Many marginal employers will fight the union to the death, figuring bankruptcy preferable to granting better paying conditions. Workers know a lot about their workplace. They know about working conditions, pay rates, shift change times, facts about the supervisors, and labor relations hacks, if any, and a host of other useful information. A lot of additional information is readily available from public sources. Financial information on many companies is available in the library on Dun & Bradstreet credit reports, Standard & Poor's corporation reports, and Moody's Investors Service comment. Remember, this is 96, so internet. These sources should indicate whether the company is part of a chain or conglomerate and its financial condition. If none of them include the employer or provide the needed information, the library or internet may have public relations material from the company or annual financial statements in the newspaper files. If not, copies of the annual report to stockholders can usually be obtained from the company's public relations office as long as they don't know what you need it for. If the target is a public institution, 
check out the information that is available under local, state, or federal public information acts. Your local public or law library can point you in the direction of those laws, and many libraries maintain clippings and other documents on local government agencies. Comment. You know, I mentioned before this was from 96, so they were talking about libraries. I do want to point out, I mean, do what you can on the internet. That said, if you have a university nearby or even just a local library, the, uh, I mean, if it's a real small town, be careful because you don't know who the librarian knows. But, um, you know, a lot of librarians have, uh, well, actually all librarians have high training in research skills, so they can definitely find stuff that the layperson can't. Many of them also would like nothing more than to use those skills uh, helping somebody, particularly a lot of, you know, librarians tend to be more left-leaning and, uh, you know, would be interested in helping out. But again, they don't necessarily need to know what it's for, but they do like doing research. That's why they're librarians. Continuing. If it is a private nonprofit institution, information can be found in the institution's tax returns. The forms, called 990s, are available at regional IRS offices. Whatever industry or type of workplace, be prepared to search out specific information and develop appropriate organizing techniques for that particular situation. Other useful sources of information about your employer include trade and local magazines, the local newspaper, the library may have an index and many maintain a clippings file for article about major local employers, or local offices of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and its state equivalent, and the National Labor Relations Board, an LRB, and, I would add, the state equivalent if there is one. While neither is much good at their stated purpose of protecting workers' rights, they do maintain extensive files. From OSHA, you can often get health and safety reports on your employer and information on complaints that have been filed against conditions at your plant or at others operated by the same employer. Sometimes they can also help with questions about the hazards of particular materials that you're working with. Comment, um, I personally have used OSHA in this way. Uh, there was an employer I was working for that was using some pretty nasty chemicals without providing any personal protective equipment, and the place wasn't even really ventilated very well. It was pretty horrible. So contacted OSHA anonymously. The employer never found out who it was. OSHA came in, did an inspection, found out it was really not good, the kind of exposure to the chemicals that was happening. The employer was fined and had to make changes to the operation. Continuing, the NLRB can provide information on past unfair labor practice charges against the company, representation elections, which, if any, other company shops or union, since when, and which union, including the local number. This information helps to get a picture of the company's record on health and safety and its probable response to your organizing drive. Check the phone book for your local office if you're in a major city, or look them up online, NLRB or OSHA, to get the local office's address and phone number. By the way, I would also add the Secretary of State website for your state probably has a corporation's lookup. If you look up the company there, you can probably find out other information about who owns it, Possibly if the corporation or whatever the business, you know, if it's an LLC or whatever, uh, if they're not legally compliant with the state in, you know, as far as any of their filings, that's something to look at as well. Continuing, if you or your fellow workers are working with chemicals or other potentially toxic substances, state and federal environmental agencies might have useful information on toxic discharges, applicable safety standards, etc. The Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, CERCLA, requires companies with 10 or more workers to make an inventory of routine toxic emissions and to make available to workers and the community material data safety sheets on some 700 extremely hazardous substances used in operations. Any worker is legally entitled to see MSDSs on any substances at their workplace, and they are usually available at local fire departments as well. Environmental groups might be able to point you in the direction of information on specific chemicals. Also try the sources listed at the back of this manual under health and safety. In some states, such as California, the federal government has turned over much of the responsibility for enforcing health and safety laws to state agencies. If you can't find an OSHA listing under federal agencies in your phone book or online, you might look for something similar under state agencies. 
and State Departments of Labor usually gather statistics on industrial accidents, which should be available both for the individual workplace and for the industry as a whole. It can be important to research the industry as well. Your library's business department or a local college library, particularly if they have a business school, should be able to point you toward a wealth of material about typical financial structures, occupational and environmental hazards, regulatory bodies, industry work norms, etc. Trade publications, specialized magazines published for executives in a particular field, can be a useful source of information as to what's on the boss's minds in the industry, and they often include detailed and frank information. They don't expect workers to be listening in. Research your target as thoroughly as possible. Don't focus solely on the economic issues. Consider ways in which their operations affect others and reach out to work together against your common enemy. Is the boss poisoning workers? Those same poisons probably hurt the local community too. Does the boss discriminate or try to divide workers against each other? If so, make it an issue. A bad boss is the best organizer. Other factors being equal, employees of an enlightened paternalist where workers are told to feel like one big happy family can be harder to organize than those of an old-fashioned tyrant. Young workers may be easier to organize than older workers tied to company pensions and fearful of losing their jobs and pensions. But young workers are often transient and may think that they have little to gain from a union. And older workers may come to believe that they have more to gain by struggling than by following policies of moderation. Comment, I think that was written a little bit strangely, but hopefully you get the point that the, sometimes younger workers will be more or less likely depending on their situation, to join the union. And same thing with older workers. They may be more or less likely, depending on where they're at. Continuing, part-time workers are usually harder to organize than full-time workers because they have less stake in improving the job. Some part-timers have second occupations, perhaps as students or homemakers. Often they regard the job as temporary, and they don't want to invest their time and energy in an organizing campaign. But increasing numbers of workers are being forced into part-time work as their main source of income and may come to see organization as their only way out. Fast food places are among the hardest of all to organize through traditional means, though they are vulnerable to solidarity campaigns that target their multitude of consumer outlets. Workers in the cooperative and social service or social change sectors of the economy shouldn't be overlooked. Such workers can often be receptive to the IWW because of the similarity between their beliefs and the unions, and such jobs are increasingly being subjected to capitalist rationalization, with management undermining or simply abolishing areas of worker self-management. Methods of organizing. Should we organize from the inside or outside? Most conventional unions organize from the outside on the basis of workers contacting them for help. Sometimes, if the target is very large or strategic, they may try to organize cold with a series of leaflets to develop contacts and build a campaign. These methods probably will not work for the IWW. We don't have an established product to sell or a substantial presence on the job. And the hostility felt by many of our fellow workers for the business unions often rebounds against us. Working from the outside, you're more vulnerable to last-minute scare campaigns and intimidation and more easily isolated from the workers you're trying to organize. Particularly for the IWW, organizing from the inside seems to offer the best chance for success. First, the employer, not the union, pays the organizer's wages. Second, and most important, the organizer will have the necessary time and opportunity on the job to give people an understanding of the IWW. Many working people understand what most unions are all about. Practically none understand the IWW, and it will take more than a few leaflets to make ourselves known. On many jobs, particularly those where the work process requires cooperation, informal work groups have developed which can play a key role in spreading union ideas and facilitating direct action. Make contact with a few key people in these circles, and they can do much of the organizing job. Employers are well aware of the existence of informal work groups, believing them to be one of the major causes of soldiering and other forms of resistance on the shop floor, not without reason. But unions have generally not paid sufficient attention to the importance of these work groups and to their potential as a basis for rank and file power in the workplace. Within the business unions, a debate goes on as to whether it is better strategy in an organizing campaign to have people just sign authorization cards, A cards, and promise them that they will not have to pay anything until a contract is signed 
or to ask people to join and pay dues during the organizing period. After many years of assuming that people would organize more readily if they had to pay nothing until assured of success, this assumption is finally being questioned. If people actually join the union, they have a more real and personal stake in its success and may be less likely to change their minds when the employer applies pressure. This approach is even more necessary for IWW organizing because several additional problems exist beyond those that other unions normally face in organizing. First, simply on the basis of immediate demands, the bread and butter questions that workers customarily organize around, the IWW is likely to be challenged by another union having more resources, a paid representative available to advise and help negotiate, and a seemingly better chance at getting the support of other unions. People are more likely to resist the lore of other unions from inside the IWW than from the outside. Second, the ultimate goals of the IWW, abolition of the wage system and establishment of workers' self-management, are integrally related to the day-to-day -day struggles on the job. These goals are linked to the IWW's structure and to the ways we conduct union business. Other unions have no such ultimate goals that conflict with most people's present conceptions of capitalism and the roles of labor, management, and government in the present system. If people are to choose the IWW as their union, they must also consciously choose to accept the ultimate goals. Industrial Organizing Ideally, of course, the IWW seeks to organize entire industries, not simply individual workplaces. Workplace job branches are building blocks towards our goal of organizing the entire working class. But if the rest of the industry pays minimum wage, you're going to be hard-pressed to win dramatically better conditions, either because the boss fears becoming uncompetitive or because there's a large supply of trained potential scabs just down the road. Scabs, by the way, are strike breakers. To win big improvements, you need to organize on an industrial basis. In the 1970s, IWW branches across the country tried to organize workers in fast food and other restaurants, lining up majorities in several before being busted out by turnover, firings, and closings. Might we have done better to try to line up all the food service workers in an area, turning the fluid nature of this workplace to our advantage and spreading the union presence? If the bosses know that the next crew they hire are just as likely to be union as the one in the shop, they might be more willing to talk turkey. Among recent IWW industrial organizing efforts are the Duplicating Workers Drive, targeting Kinko's, and the Education Workers Industrial Union Drive, working to build on our relatively strong presence in schools and colleges. Industrial organizing committees could develop organizing materials and other support for local organizers, link up organizers across the country and around the globe, set and fight for an industry-wide wage scale, and pool information and resources the IWW and conventional unions. Some IWW organizers have tried to skirt this issue, presenting the IWW with its low dues and minimal staff as a bargain basement alternative to conventional unions. These campaigns have ignored the basic differences between the IWW and every other union, recognition of the class struggle, the need for class-wide unity, and the fact that the only way to end that struggle is by abolishing the wage system. This sort of organizing tries to chop the IWW in two, separating the preamble, where the union's values are stated, from the union as a vehicle for winning immediate demands. The thrust of such campaigns is, in effect, forget about these visionary ideas. We believe in them, but we don't expect you common working people to. Just take us as a pure and simple union for the present. These campaigns, which tried to sell the IWW as a good, young, poor, clean union against the bad, old, rich, corrupt ones, have been uniformly unsuccessful. Why? By dumping the preamble, we give up our strongest ground, completely ignoring the principal argument against the business unions. They're based upon an untrue premise, and therefore they cannot solve our problems. The conventional business unions are based on the premise that labor and capital are partners with the government as an umpire in a system of class collaboration that will benefit everyone. These unions explicitly deny that a class struggle exists, thus they deny the most essential function of any combination of working people, mutual protection against the employing class. Yet, most working people know that their interests are not the same as their employers and that they are neither friends nor partners. 
They know that the politicians who make up the government are more beholden to capital than to labor, and therefore they are biased umpires at best. In recognizing the government's right to umpire the employer-employee relationship, the business unions renounce their one real source of strength, economic power, in favor of the futile gestures of lobbying and political action. How can such an illogical institution be expected to serve working people efficiently? Well, how have those unions served them? The business unions have gradually given away the gains of the 1930s, contenting themselves with buy union, buy American bumper stickers. They have watched the employers export their jobs to unorganized, lower wage countries. They have acquiesced meekly to speed ups and hazardous working conditions, while the employers profited from working people's increased productivity. They have presided over faring real wage rates through direct givebacks to the employers and through wages that don't keep up with inflation. They have ordered union members to scab on each other in obedience to the, quote, impartial umpire's ban on their strongest weapons, the picket line and the secondary boycott, class solidarity. Some working people, bargaining through these unions, have undeniably made gains in wages, security, and conditions, but in spite of the union structure, and only where they have forced the issues with their economic strength. This massive failure wasn't caused by corrupt officials, but by the basically unreal position of the conventional unions. 1. Partnership implies equal power. Within the limits that the unions attempt to confine their members, the power is decidedly unequal. 2. While denying officially that a class struggle exists, the business unions tacitly admit that reality by bargaining with employers and setting up grievance machinery. 3. Supporting the wage system, the conventional unions are therefore committed to trying to make it work, quote, fairly, at the expense of the class interests of their members. Witness the frequency with which AFL-CIO unions bail out or support, quote, their employers in distress at the expense of other working people. 4. Subscribing to the government as umpire theory, the conventional unions meekly comply with each new restriction on working people's rights to use their economic power. They forget that the employing class uses its money to buy umpires who will tend to render favorable decisions to their class. Local officials may be very honest and sincere people, but they are immobilized by these contradictions. Even if they themselves understand the class struggle and would really like to see their locals bargain on that basis, they simply can't accomplish much against the weight of the rest of the union structure. More often, they accept the official myth and therefore label as troublemakers those union members who disagree. Anyone trapped in the same circumstances would react this way. A conventional union offers paid professional negotiators. But since the economic power of the workers themselves is the only consideration that moves the employer to grant concessions, these negotiators really can't accomplish any more than a committee from the job armed with the facts. The security of a big, quote, international union with many members and many signed agreements. The price for that security is an unremitting battle against the pressures to get along with the employer and sacrifice working conditions and individual militants in the process. Third, a large strike fund. This fund is usually controlled by the international union and may be used only with international sanction. Besides, the legal starve-out strike today is one of the most costly and least rewarding weapons for working people. It is the only weapon, however, that most conventional unions sanction. They discourage job actions, slowdowns, wildcats, and other such tactics, in part for fear of being sued by employers or having their funds impounded by the government. So the strike fund is often not available to the members, and instead it becomes a club to discipline members for taking direct action. A new group organizing under a business union can expect, in succession, 1. Statements that the union will give them security, the opportunity to bargain for improved wages and conditions, and control of their own agreement. 2. Pressure, meanwhile, to let the union, rather than the people on the job, direct the organizing campaign. 3. After the employer recognizes the union, pressure to let the union, rather than the workers on the job, dictate the contents of the agreement. 4. After the agreement is signed, pressure by the union to ignore individual grievances, speed up and poor working conditions, provided the employer pays the wages and provides the benefits under the agreement. 5. Pressure to acquiesce in the employer's moves to eliminate troublemakers who refuse to be quiet. 
Nothing short of a good understanding of class interests and the differences between the IWW and other unions is going to hold a group in the IWW. In the past, many IWW members have argued that any union is better than no union and have helped conventional unions organize. This choosing a second best situation has generally been based on two considerations, that right now some improvement in the immediate conditions of their fellow workers was desirable and possible, and that even within the limited perspective of a business union, class consciousness and a sense of solidarity could be developed. In other words, organized workers, no matter what union they belong to, could be considered one step nearer the goal of the IWW than unorganized workers. Entire IWW organizing campaigns and job branches have been turned over to the business unions on this reasoning. The business unions can devote immense resources to organizing the job should they choose to do so. And they do have certain advantages, as most workers are unfamiliar with IWW unionism. But while some business unions are better than others, none has the IWW's commitment to revolutionary unionism, direct action, and workers' self-management. A conventional union might be able to win a pay hike, but so can the IWW. But when the boss speeds up the line, asks you to handle scab goods, or has the foreman breathing down your neck, the most they'll be able to do is file a grievance. AFL-CIO contracts almost always forbid strikes during the life of the contract let alone direct action. That may be fine for the lawyers, but it's no way to run a union or to build workers' awareness of their industrial power. If you don't have the strength to win IWW majority status on the job and a business union gets representation, you should work to keep the IWW nucleus together to organize the job right. And the business unions also have important weaknesses. We are all familiar with the public distaste for, quote, big labor, and the widespread belief that high-paid, long-serving union officers are out of touch with rank-and-file members. Our fellow workers believe this because it's true. The IWW, however, is carefully structured to keep control in the hands of the membership. We have no high-paid officers, no lifetime sinecures, no large treasuries, and fancy offices to protect. IWW dues are deliberately kept low, as we have learned that it's best to keep the union treasury in the members' pockets where it's safe from court fines. Unlike conventional unions, the IWW relies on direct payment of dues. Too many unions rely on the boss to serve as union treasurer through the dues checkoff. That's where they take it right out of the paycheck. Workers pay dues willy-nilly as the boss takes the money from their wages just like taxes and insurance. With direct payments of dues, each worker comes into contact with the delegate at least once a month and has an easy opportunity to discuss job conditions and the union. When there is no checkoff, the way dues are paid is a direct barometer of the member's satisfaction, or lack of it, with the union and its officers. Direct collection of dues ensures at least a minimum level of regular contact between members and officers. It guarantees rank-and-file control over the source of union funds, and thus protects against the growth of an undemocratic, unaccountable bureaucracy. Part 3. The Organizing Campaign Initially, the organizer must win acceptance as a person, a good human being, and fellow worker. This takes time, and until it's accomplished, your ideas generally won't matter in the least. A good organizer is well-liked and well-respected. Conversely, the organizer also likes and respects their fellow workers. Having gained the respect of your fellow workers, you can begin to let them know your economic and social views and exchange ideas with them. One of the best ways of making a point is to ask questions that lead your fellow workers to the conclusions that you have already reached. Go from the familiar and particular to the general and abstract. An abstract idea is more likely to be important to a person if it plainly bears on everyday life. When you talk with people, work with their strengths and leave their weak points for later. Communicating ideas goes by the feel of it. If you can't feel when the situation is right and comfortable, you probably aren't in touch with your fellow workers in the first place. Before you can think about launching a public organizing campaign, you will need to build a nucleus in the workplace of IWW members, with whom you will work jointly on the whole effort. Assemble this nucleus quietly and deliberately, without letting management or the rest of the workforce know that there is an organizing campaign in prospect. Try to sign up those individuals most receptive to the IWW, on the basis of their complete support of the IWW program, 
and the premise that maybe the IWW can organize the place. If they agree with the program but are not sure that the place can be organized into the IWW, leave that decision open until later and sign them up. If they want to wait to join the IWW until an organizing drive gets going, maybe you can work with them on that basis. Whatever its composition, the nucleus should be firmly committed to organizing the workplace. So I just want to comment here. This is the IWW organizing manual, and as I think you can tell from the entire manual up to this point, it's not just about techniques, it's also trying to sell the IWW as a concept. However, you can use these techniques even if you are not trying to organize with the IWW, if you're trying to organize an independent freestanding union or whatever. So things are often going to be presented in this manual in terms of, you know, trying to organize the workplace into the IWW. Just bear in mind, if that is not your goal, just take those parts with a grain of salt. However, do at least try to understand that vision as they're presenting it, because it is a coherent vision, whether or not it's what you specifically want to do. Continuing. Consider with your fellow workers the possible options. One, to organize into the IWW with the goal of union recognition and collective bargaining. Two, to organize a shop committee and agitate and bargain informally for certain demands without trying to get a signed contract. Three, to organize around a single issue with wide appeal, possibly as the first step toward later organizing a union or shop committee. Whatever form of organization you finally choose, the nucleus will be studying, listening, evaluating, and planning. You will be finding out all you can about the company's financial and productive position, its labor history and policies, and the nature of other unions that might compete in an organizing campaign. This will be a continuous, intense process, all the while waiting for the opportune time to make the move to organize. So comment, you basically you're gathering intelligence on this company at every level from the shop floor to their financial dealings. Basically, you are trying to take it over. Know your enemy. The idea here is, again, shifting the balance of power from the bosses and their managers towards the workers. You really have to know this thing inside and out to minimize surprises as you proceed. The Organizing Committee When a job becomes the target of concerted organizing work, the first step generally is to form an organizing committee. The organizing committee should include at least one wobbly from the workplace and should be chosen on the basis of past organizing and direct action experience and familiarity with the industry and legal restrictions. Members of the committee should inventory the skills which they have among them. What experience do people have in organizing, negotiations, and direct action? Who has public speaking experience or has put together a newsletter? The committee's job is to help build an active group of members, a job branch, at the workplace, particularly by assisting with the tasks that can't practically or safely be carried out by wobblies on the shop floor. The job branch then takes control of the campaign and the committee is dissolved, although the job branch is, of course, encouraged to call outside members for assistance and advice. The methods and goals of the organizing committee should be planned and developed in order to pass on the skills and tools and information necessary for the development of a job branch capable of conducting its own affairs in a democratic fashion, both in periods of intense activity and in the inevitable dry spells when little seems to be happening. The organizing committee should be established by the nearest IWW branch or group in response to a request for organizing assistance and should report on its progress and activities at least monthly to the branch and the general executive board. Financial, advisory, and moral support is generally available from other IWW branches, especially the closer ones. Don't hesitate to get in touch and let them know what you need. While in some situations, particularly at larger workplaces, Leafleting and similar open organizing efforts may make sense from the start. It often makes more sense in the early stages of a campaign to approach workers individually. Whatever the tactics chosen, the organizing committee should focus its efforts on building the basis for IWW members on the job to take over and sustain the campaign. Job and Industrial Union Branches IWW job branches are organized wherever five or more wobblies are working on the same job. The job branch is the organized IWW presence on the job. 
It coordinates organizing efforts, presses grievances, negotiates with the boss, etc. A job branch need not represent a majority of the workforce to be effective. It can mobilize workers around particular, widely felt grievances, even if most workers do not yet recognize the need for a union. Industrial union branches are generally chartered on a regional, that is, city, county, etc., small enough area that it is practical for members to meet, basis, although sometimes it may make sense to establish an industrial union branch to deal with a particularly large employer. Industrial union branches bring together all IWW workers in the same industry, whether they have established job control or not. IU branches keep branch allowance on IWW dues and serve as coordinating and support bodies for job branches and local organizing efforts. They may arrange affiliation with local general membership branches. I just want to comment here as it's going to talk about the general membership branch. There is another guide that we put up on the channel. It's the IWW branch organizing manual for industrial union 640 in the IWW. If you're interested in learning more about the particulars of what each of these branch organizations do, check out that manual. It has less to do with workplace organizing or almost nothing to do with workplace organizing, but more to do with the overall structure of the union. Role of the general membership branch. A branch is an official unit of the IWW with rights and responsibilities defined in the IWW Constitution. While the basic organizational unit of the IWW is the job branch, which brings together members working on the same job, the most visible unit is the geographically based general membership branch or GMB. A GMB must have 10 or more active members who live close enough to attend meetings together and is entitled to retain half the dues and initiation fees of local members. The branch must include all members in an area before it has a right to speak for the IWW there, and it may include scattered members in the surrounding area if those members so desire. In areas with fewer than 10 members, an IWW group may be formed. Job branch members should participate in their local GMB and or industrial union branch, bringing together job branches in the same industry on a local level both to help spread IWW ideas and to assist each other's organizing efforts. The branch is a small community of like-minded workers who are acting together through the union. One of its main activities is to organize new members. The best organizing is face-to-face. -face. Personal contact is critical. It can happen on the job during breaks and lunches, or off the job in public places or people's homes. Social affairs such as union picnics, ball games, and parties are good places for workers to meet and relate to each other and to the union. A, quote, paper army of members in name only can't accomplish anything. The branch needs to get and keep members active. When someone joins the branch, especially if they're from a new work site, an active branch member should take the time to talk to that new member personally. Find out why they joined the IWW what particular issues are important to them, if they're willing to distribute materials where they work, if they'd like to write an article for the branch newsletter, etc. Presumably, they joined because they support the union and want to help it grow, but many people will be hesitant to volunteer their ideas or to jump in without an invitation. Always seek to involve the new member in current and future projects, but without overwhelming them with work. An effective organizer is a teacher. Teach people how to do things for themselves. A good way to do that is to have different tasks carried out by small committees which pair experienced members with newer members. Encourage members to serve on various committees like newsletter, industrial worker distribution, fundraising, etc. to build the union. If members are asked to do tasks, the chances of getting them done are much greater than when everyone waits for spontaneous urges of others to carry out the work. Asking members to get involved also spreads the work around and avoids the common situation of too few doing too much and getting burned out. Each member should be actively encouraged to do at least one of the following jobs. Distribute the industrial worker and the branch newsletter where they work. I mean, the industrial worker is the newspaper of the IWW. Talk to people at work about the union and workplace issues. Promote branch activities. Give input to the branch newsletter and industrial worker acting as a reporter on local issues, investigating local contracts and working conditions, etc. Keeping people active in these ways will help your local network grow, 
through their contacts and influence. It will ensure that you know about important struggles in your area and have the opportunity to lend your support to them. Branch members have the responsibility for building this network of activists and organizers. They should seek out new members in new workplaces. One way to reach new people is to write an article for the branch newsletter about problems faced by potential groups of new members and contacts, and to make sure that the newsletter gets to them. Another way is to be sure that the industrial worker and the branch newsletter are distributed in and near as many potential organizing sites as possible. I just want to comment on this. They've sort of mentioned um, open campaigns twice. I'm sure that they're going to get into more details on that. Um, you should generally be careful about that because if an employer catches wind that a union is sort of sizing up their site, if they see those sort of materials you know, lying around, uh, it may put them on alert. So just be careful with that. And you know, if you're working with a group, consider that as a group, etc. Continuing. To reach people, we have to make it easy for them to find us. People will call a phone line faster than they will sit down and write a letter. Comment again, this is 96, so you know, we're talking about newsletters and newspapers and phone lines and letters. Obviously, you know, social media was more than a decade off at this point. Continuing. People will call or write or even drop by if they have a concrete reason to. Potential members will seek out working class organizations that offer meaningful services. Witness the history of mutual aid societies and cooperatives. A post office box and a phone line with an answering machine makes the branch easy to reach. The distribution of newsletters, industrial workers, silent agitators, which are like stickers basically advertising the IWW, and other printed materials, including information on how to get in touch with the union and how it can help, gets the word to potential members. IWW branches can offer services such as advice lines for dealing with the unemployment system, paralegal advice regarding workplace rights, etc. Cultural events and open meetings also offer the branch a chance to come together and to network with other workers in the area, and strike solidarity efforts can offer concrete examples of the possibilities for working class solidarity, helping our fellow workers in their struggles while implicitly challenging the everyone for themselves attitude that is so prevalent in our society. So just a comment there, I like that they emphasized potential members will seek out working class organizations that offer meaningful services. You know, organizing with a union, this is not just some abstract, like, it's a good thing to do, aren't we good people, etc. I mean, yeah, it is that. It's a good thing to do. It, there are immediate rewards, and it's nice to work with other working people rather than competing against other working people. All that is great. But it's also about solving practical problems. There's a real empowerment in doing that. So if a group is able to set up services like that in an area, it definitely can be a magnet. The right time to organize. Timing is perhaps the single most important factor in organizing. Most places can't be organized at the wrong time. Many, but not all, can be organized at the right time. Often the decisive factor in a successful campaign is an incident or situation that reveals to people the need for and possibility of changing their situation, that tips the workplace towards action. Wait for the situation to begin the active campaign. It might be new machines, new processes, safety violations, or speed up. Speed up is when basically, I mean it's fairly self-explanatory, more work is expected within the same amount of time. Sometimes, marked union success in a similar establishment locally or in another facility of the same employer will tip the workplace. Comment, that's very true. Um, sometimes, you know, employers wise up and they tighten up all the workplaces in such a way that it makes the expansion of the union across locations or, you know, job sites uh, more difficult. But you can see, for example, right now in the Starbucks union, it's just spreading you know, one after the other, Starbucks locations are getting unionized, and that's great. Continuing. But without some impetus, either from within or without, the campaign probably won't move. Timing is also related to business conditions. Most people have their jobs pretty well figured out long before an organizer shows up. An impending layoff means that a strike isn't likely to be successful. 
On the other hand, a new contract to fill may strengthen the work group's capability to pull off a strike or some other job action. If the demands are seasonal, figure out when the employer can least afford disruptions and delays. Comment. Another way to put that is, when are the employees most indispensable? Whether to act at any given moment involves weighing the immediate situation and prospects. The work situation is not sitting on solid ground, but poised in midair, to be tipped toward or away from action by any change in people's perception of it. Objectively, all working people possess the economic power to control their own workplaces, provided that they understand their power and act on this understanding. However, working people in any given place cannot necessarily predict or control important external factors, the willingness of others to take their jobs, as replacement workers, for example, the degree of outside help to expect, community support, union support, etc., their ability to make workers outside understand and support their efforts, and the degree of commitment of their own group. Even then, evaluate your position carefully. You have more strength when business is good and the workforce is needed than when a layoff is in prospect. How much does the employer really need these present employees right now, and how easily could they be replaced? If demand is seasonal, when can the employer least afford delays and disruptions in the operation? If enough factors are favorable, and the wobblies on the job decide this, then move. The One Issue Campaign? Maybe instead of trying to organize a union, you decide to organize a campaign around a single issue to gain one point. This is not a retreat, nor a trivial undertaking. The single issue campaign may be the catalyst that will later bring the workplace together to fight for other demands, or to organize a standing union. Besides gaining the necessary objective, the campaign can develop mutual trust and a strong sense of solidarity. Winning that point can give people self-confidence and convince them better than a thousand words that they do indeed have economic power with which to improve their lives, because it will have just been demonstrated. While this manual's focus is on organizing a job branch, most of the information is also relevant for a one-issue campaign. Whether you decide to organize a union or to build a campaign around one issue, organize to win. The Job Branch The IWW Constitution provides that a job branch is to be established when there are at least five IWW members in a workplace. The job branch has a dual function, to organize the rest of the workplace and to, so far as possible, defend workers' interests in the meantime. In practice, of course, these functions overlap. If you're able to win a grievance or improve working conditions through direct action, for example, it's bound to give organizing efforts a boost. The job branch is the IWW's basic unit of industrial organization. All IWW members at the workplace should join and actively participate in the job branch. Without organization, five wobblies on a job are just that. Through the job branch, they can coordinate their efforts and establish a functioning, visible, even if small, IWW presence on the shop floor. There's a little sidebar with an anecdote here. One group of young workers with no previous union experience made a reasonable demand on their employer. Management responded by stalling and evading the issue. The workers continued to press the demand, meanwhile looking for an opportunity to force the point. One day, a load of sacks of cement arrived at the job site in an open truck just as heavy black clouds threatened momentarily to pour down rain. The water would ruin the cement. The supervisor started to hustle the crew to unload the cement. The crew declined to move until the long-neglected demand was dealt with. The supervisor promised to talk about it after the cement was under cover. The crew still didn't move. Raindrops began to fall. The supervisor granted the demand, and the crew promptly unloaded the cement. Soon afterwards, they won union recognition. In recent years, the view that a union, in order to be effective, has to line up the majority of the workforce and negotiate a contract has come to be widely accepted, even among many IWW members. But though it's true that the stronger and more broadly based union support is, 
the more economic power can be brought to bear, a great deal can still be accomplished by a small group on the shop floor working to mobilize their fellow workers around particular grievances and to coordinate direct action campaigns. Maintaining an ongoing union presence of this sort does far more than leaflets alone can to show that you're serious about winning better conditions and that real unionism doesn't depend on government certification or a large treasury, but is working people acting together in concert to defend their interests against those of their employers. The IWW is a democratic union of workers operating within a constitutional structure. The job branch is controlled by its members and is thus the foundation of union democracy. With a bare minimum of members to maintain administrative functions and some continuity, the IWW recognizes the rights of workers on the shop floor to decide workplace issues and control their own affairs. The job branch, not union organizers or the general executive board, controls the organizing campaign, decides what issues are important and what tactics to pursue. For this union democracy to be effective, you need to adopt democratic working rules. A body without structure tends to become undemocratic and to develop cliques. Making the job branch grow. Having established a job branch, again that's five or more people, union-minded, working together in the workplace, a great deal remains to be done to organize your workplace. You need to get and update information on the company, on workplace hazards, pay scales, and other working conditions and procedures. Having this information on hand makes it possible to respond quickly to issues as they arise and to avoid the kinds of careless mistakes that can discredit a campaign. You need to reach out to departments and shifts not represented in the job branch and to strive to include members from all ethnic, racial, age, and sex groups on the job. Without this sort of broad-based support, it's all too easy for the employer to isolate union supporters and to play workers off against each other and try to assemble a complete list of employees, including their contact info and addresses if you can get them as soon as possible. It's often useful to develop working subcommittees to divide up tasks and accomplish the practical work of the organizing campaign and to involve as many members as possible. Suggested committees include 1. Membership to compile and keep up to date a list of names, addresses, departments, classifications, shifts, and other pertinent information about all employees. 2. House calls to arrange appointments and coordinate them with available union supporters to make the house calls. 3. Ways and means to handle all finances and arrangements, including purchases and bills, meeting arrangements and transportation. 4. Publicity to prepare leaflets, letters, newsletters, news releases, and social media posts. 5. Distribution. Responsible for distributing leaflets and preparing mailings. Local situations may necessitate other committees, such as for legal defense, to mediate problems within the group, mutual aid, etc. Structure your committees to meet concrete needs, not an abstract plan. A worker that you suspect may be a company plant or a politico trying to use the campaign for private ends may offer to help. Let them help in a non-sensitive area, such as distributing leaflets or stuffing mail, and have a trustworthy committee member keep an eye on them. Keep such people away from names of union supporters and house calls, where they would have an opportunity to speak for the union. So commenting, this is definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, companies will go to great lengths to avoid having a union being set up in their workplace. Uh, that definitely includes espionage. It's an unfair labor practice, and, you know, in other words, it's illegal. They can be reprimanded by the government for it, but that doesn't stop them from doing it. Also, as soon as they do, you know, catch wind of this, they will probably hire an anti-union, union-busting lawyer, uh, and many employers will spend far more money paying these lawyers, paying this law firm, then whatever you know pay increases or benefits the employees are asking for because ultimately again this is about power a union is trying to shift power away from the owners and their managers who are basically proxies or agents of the owners people who legally own the business and have the power to hire and fire and guess what they don't want to give that power up <laughs> so they will go to great lengths including spending a lot of money to do that it's definitely not past them to 
try to you know spy on your organization, though it is not legally allowed per U.S. labor law. So something to keep in mind. Continuing, the job branch may want to study information on the labor laws applying to the campaign in order to understand your legal rights and those of the employer. Some sources for this are listed at the end of this manual. Many public libraries have the Bureau of National Affairs Labor Reports and other good material. Labor law is a specialized field, comment also sometimes called industrial relations, and labor attorneys are expensive. Sometimes you can get good information from the regional NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, office. Having some familiarity with labor law can help you to know what to expect from the employer and the government and to be prepared to deal with it. It's extremely important not to rely on labor law to protect your rights to organize, etc. Many of your supposed rights enshrined in the labor laws exist only on paper, and it can often take years for cases to make their way through NLRB hearings and appeals. Even when you do win through the labor laws, you may end up losing. Endless hours are eaten up pursuing the case, momentum is lost, and power is shifted from the workplace to the boss's courts. While you should know the law in order to make informed decisions about your options, the workplace remains your real source of strength. few comments there. So I think that that's a good uh, closing point for that paragraph. The workplace remains your real source of strength. It's your labor that produces the profit for the business, and this is your leverage over the employer. They can't do anything without employees. That's not to say that they don't have counter leverage against you, such as the ability to hire and fire, but basically that is why you're there in the workplace, to make goods and services. So do remember that. Now, I want to say about, you know, they caution against over-reliance on the NLRB. Some people take this to mean that it's completely useless, and I don't want you to get that in your head. Because if nothing else, as kind of a, you know, parachute at the end or, you know, safety net... Um, filing something with the NLRB can, and yes, it can take a long time sometimes, but it can, if nothing else, like let's say you try to organize a campaign, things don't come together, you get fired by the employer illegally before, you know, basically you get fired just for trying to unionize, which is illegal. Um, you know, that's, again, people do break the law, employers included. And uh, so let's say you got illegally fired trying to unionize and, you know, you're unemployed for a couple months, then you find another job, whatever. Do make that filing with the NLRB for the unfair labor practice. I've seen a number of cases where people did that, and then they got awarded back pay. It's not to say it's going to happen in every case, but like I said, as a sort of safety net, you know, your real strength is on the shop floor, but, you know, it's a patchy safety net. There are holes in it, but again, as a last-ditch strategy, keep it in your back pocket. Don't forget about it. You know, especially with the sort of decimated state of the labor movement and how precarious everybody's situation is, you know, if you get awarded a few thousand dollars of back pay, it can make a big difference. So, you know, don't walk away from that. Also, remember, even if you're leaving a workplace and, you know, your job branch or your organizing committee, whatever, uh, the people who are on that job trying to organize it with you, uh, at some point, you might collectively decide that it's just not worth the effort and you're all going to move on. Remember, you're not going to be the last people to be employed at that workplace. So you can at least try to leave some kind of legacy for the workers who are going to be, unfortunately, employed by that employer after you. So if there's unsafe conditions, try to file an OSHA report. If there were illegal union practices being done by the employer, try to file a complaint with the NLRB, etc. Even if you don't see any direct benefit out of it, you could help to give the employer a black eye on the way out the door that the next time somebody tries to organize that workplace, you know, NLRB might say, oh, so we have an employer that has violated the law in the past and it might give, you know, future workers an advantage should it come to something like that. It puts it on their record, in other words. So think about the workers who come after you that's going to take different forms depending on, you know, what the particular circumstances are. Just keep it in mind, even if you don't see benefit. Continuing. The job branch must agree on a public address for mail, possibly a post office box. It should decide how much money will be needed and how and where to raise it. 
Organizing funds from IWW General Administration are limited. Where to find equipment to produce leaflets and letters, and where the job branch and committees can meet and work. It's important to make sure that meeting sites are convenient for the members. The issues. The job branch should be able to agree on the key issues in the workplace around which people will be most ready to organize. Issues tend to group themselves around two general subjects, human dignity, which involves workplace conditions, safety, speed up, seniority, union security, non-discrimination, job organization and control, and the like, and bread and butter, wages, health and other benefits, and the like. Both are important, and they both deserve thoughtful consideration. You may also want to raise demands speaking to broader community concerns, such as pollution. The job branch should try to get hold of other union agreements, though these are often written in language intended to make them incomprehensible. While the bread and butter issues of wages and benefits are necessary to the individual worker's economic survival, the issues involving human dignity are the underpinning of the union, and therefore of the rest of the conditions. Without the union and job security, workers will be hard-pressed to protect their bread and butter gains. The branch should reach agreement on the key issues around which it will organize and act. Later, if a new situation develops, this decision can be altered, but at every point in the campaign, you should work with a given set of issues democratically adopted. Making contacts. The best way to organize is face-to-face -face personal contact, on the job, during breaks and lunch periods, and off the job in social contacts or visits to workers' homes. Make every effort to get to know each of your fellow workers personally. Social affairs are good places to get acquainted with workers and maybe put in a word for the union. Leaflets and letters are important, but by themselves are often not enough. Early in the campaign, you may want to use leaflets. The first one may be general, introducing the IWW and unionism, and suggesting why your workplace needs to unionize. After that, the leaflets or letters should discuss the issues in the campaign and details about the union, due structure, rights of members, and so on. This information can anticipate some of the issues the employer will likely raise later. In any leaflet or newsletter, be sure to offer an easy way to get in touch with you. Many unions distribute authorization cards, signed statements by individual workers authorizing the union to represent them. Although employers could theoretically recognize the union on the basis of such authorizations, in practice, they're usually used to trigger an NLRB election as part of all leaflets and newsletters. If you are going the NLRB route, you will ultimately need authorization cards. But even if you aren't going that route, the cards or a similar response coupon can help to develop a list of contacts to work with, particularly in parts of the workplace where the union is not strong. Leaflets should be short and to the point. Don't overload them with dry facts or tiny type. Try to touch your readers emotionally. Be clear, explaining what you want readers to do. Write several drafts and test them out on friends and union supporters, and invite criticism and suggestions before you print up a thousand copies and start handing them out. Be honest from the outset. Don't promise that the union will deliver this or that. Point out that the union is a tool that workers can use, and their own strength and determination will decide how much or little they gain from a union. Do not promise them protections against firing for union activity. The law says employers may not do that, but they do it every day. Again, the solidarity of the group will be their real protection. The surest way to lose people's respect is to deceive them and lie to them. No solid union group was ever built on a bunch of dupes who didn't know what might happen next. Once a favorable contact is made, hang on to the person. Try to sign them up into the IWW. Make sure they understand that their help is welcome in the campaign. People become committed to an undertaking in proportion to how much they give of themselves to it. This is one of the best reasons for not, as the business unions so often do, merely asking people to sign authorization cards. Signing a card may be a useful first step, and it may give some sense of the level of interest in the workplace, but many people will sign them just to get rid of union organizers or to scare the boss into a raise. Many unions have gotten signed authorization cards from a solid majority of the workers and then have gone on to lose an NLRB election six or eight weeks later. Besides, the help will be needed 
and the more people involved, the less plausible the employer's inevitable charge that the campaign is being carried on by outside agitators or just a handful of malcontents. Dealing with fear. If you're honest with people, all of you will understand that you risk your jobs to some degree in a union organizing effort. Most people understandably don't want to and can't afford to lose their jobs. Being sensible people, your fellow workers will likely have some fear to overcome before organizing. What is the best way to deal with that fear? There are various legal stratagems that are often suggested to put the employer on notice that an organizing drive is underway, in hopes of laying the groundwork for later challenging the firing of any union activists. If interested, consult the sources listed in the back. Most important is to use your common sense and avoid making things easy for the boss. Union activists should not use working time to organize, and in general should be sure to keep their noses clean, making sure not to give the boss a, quote, legitimate reason for discharge. Show up on time, follow the rules, don't take a swing at the boss no matter what the provocation. Organizing is difficult enough without having to deal with a key activist being fired for, quote, just cause. It is, however, perfectly legal to organize on the employer's property before and after work and during break time, as long as you don't interfere with others working. Of course, this may not stop the boss from firing you, but it's legal nonetheless. Avoid the appearance of one or two workers spearheading the drive, as they may prove too tempting a target for many bosses. You need to spread out the visible work among as many people as possible, without spotlighting anyone as, quote, the organizer. Use off-the-job organizers and supporters for vocal roles or for meetings with the boss, unless you can bring so many workers that it's impractical to fire them all, especially in the early stages when you only have a few members on the job. Care must be taken in handling membership lists and associated information that could endanger workers' jobs if it fell into the boss's hands. But while reasonable precautions make sense, too great an emphasis on secrecy implies that the only safe course for union supporters is to keep everyone else from discovering how they feel about the union. This means not discussing it on the job, not attending meetings, and not helping distribute union literature. This is not a good atmosphere for organizing, and it makes especially difficult the essential task of building a functioning job branch on the shop floor. Regardless of how much or how little you decide to emphasize confidentiality of names, you must devise the best possible security system for handling the names of union supporters. Maybe the branch can elect two or three of its most trustworthy members to have custody of the membership records, reports on attitudes of contacts, and the like. Loose talk about who does or doesn't support the union can do no good and may well jeopardize people's jobs. Let union supporters make their own statements. Of course, you may well want to make a public showing of union support, particularly when that support becomes substantial. There's nothing like a sea of IWW buttons, a horde of workers descending on the front office to demand union recognition, or a shift change picket or rally at the main gate to let the employers and any of your fellow workers who may be wavering know that you're serious. In the end, Union and individual security are based not on the NLRB or the labor laws, but on your strength in the workplace. House calls. For employees with whom you have no other personal contact, house calls are very important. Try hard to contact personally all workers except those known to be absolutely hostile to the union. Making appointments for house calls shows consideration for both the employee and the person making calls, and it probably assures more favorable circumstances for the call. One or two job branch members could make the phone calls to set up appointments and then match appointments to the free time of available house callers with the most economical use of time and transportation. You may want to go in teams. If women living alone may be reluctant to let strange men into their homes at night, you may want to send women organizers, or a man and a woman, to call on them. Take a look at yourself before you go knocking on strangers' doors on behalf of the union. You should be neat and clean. Don't make your job harder with a bad first impression. Above all, you should not only show, but really feel respect for the employee and their family. Unless there's very high turnover on the job, relatively new employees, less than a year's employment, should not make house calls. They simply won't know enough about the workplace, and they may not be accepted by long-time employees. You need not be a glib, professional salesperson type to make house calls. 
In fact, don't go there to sell, but to talk over an important matter of mutual concern. The person you're calling on is not only a fellow worker on the job, but also a complete individual whose real interests likely lie outside the job. If you can establish some communication, some common interest with that off-the-job person and their family, you will likely have more success with the on-the-job person. Accommodate yourself courteously to the home. Shut gates, don't track in mud. You may find the TV on and staying on, children running in and out. Accept these things and relax. If a person wants to talk sports or world affairs or gardening, talk these things. It is really a compliment that the person sees the individual behind the organizer. Later, you will find a way to get back to the union and introduce your ideas. How much can you accomplish with a house call? Don't waste your time on a person completely hostile to the union. You're not going to change a lifetime of prejudice and company loyalty in one evening. Wind up the call and leave. Don't butt heads in a knockdown, drag out argument over some minor point. Even if you win the argument, you may lose the union a supporter, because people usually won't be bullied into accepting an idea. Turn the point at issue aside and go on to more important subjects. If you approach the people you call on with genuine respect for their persons and their ideas, the interview will generally go well. If the person shows active interest in the union, encourage them to participate in the campaign and ask for names of other employees who might welcome a visit from a union representative. Don't outstay your welcome. Leave before the family gets tired of you. As soon as possible after leaving the house, write a brief report including an evaluation of the person's attitude toward the union, advisability of further contact, possible help in the campaign, and anything else significant. Turn this over promptly to the committee or person in charge of keeping these records. So just a quick comment there. Um, you know, this is talking about going to people's houses and being respectful in their space, etc. I saw some things on social media recently where a larger account posted something about, you know, not using substances during organizing work, which prompted a lot of backlash from people I can only assume have never done any organizing because this is the kind of situation that we're talking about. You know, if you're trying to raise support for a workplace union or any other kind of thing and you're knocking on people's houses drunk or high, that is, I, I can't even words fail for what a bad, disrespectful idea that is. So, honestly, uh, some of the response to that post was um, concerning, to say the least. Continuing. Publicity. While personal contact is generally the best way to reach people, printed propaganda such as leaflets and letters can help get your message broadly distributed. All written materials should be the result of a group, such as a publicity or outreach committee, working together. Several people arguing and discussing a leaflet together may not be the fastest way to get things done, but it helps clarify what you're trying to say, and it avoids careless blunders that can easily happen in the rush to get something out. No matter if one person actually writes the leaflet, it should express faithfully the ideas of the branch and be approved by it. The branch knows far better than any single individual what is important to the rest of the workers and what they want information about. If one person then drafts the leaflet, take it back to the group for approval. Be very sure of your facts. Statements that aren't true undermine confidence in the union. Avoid excessive badmouthing, as it often creates sympathy for the person you're picking on. Leaflets must do three things. Get themselves read, convince the readers of something, and move the reader to action. To get themselves read, they should be neat, attractive, and uncrowded, with a catchy headline or graphic, short paragraphs, and plenty of white space. To convince the reader, they should begin and end with strong paragraphs, deal with only one or two ideas, expressed in simple, clear language, depending on facts rather than emotion to convince. Don't talk down to people. Avoid dull, pedantic wordiness and hackneyed rhetoric that destroys credibility. Use as few words as necessary. Extra dead words weaken the impact of your message. To move the reader to action, a leaflet should provide logical arguments for doing something reasonable signing a petition, joining the union, attending a meeting. All leaflets and letters should be signed, not necessarily by individuals, but by the organizing committee or job branch. If you can assemble some examples of good organizing leaflets, they might help to provide ideas. Some of the big unions have professional media people design packages of organizing material. Whatever you put out, each piece should be carefully thought out 
and produced as attractively as your resources will allow. A neat photocopied or even mimeographed, if that's what you have available, comment, we've moved on, I think, from that at this point. Leaflet can be just as effective as a two-color printed job, provided it says the right things. A sloppy leaflet full of typos and bad grammar shows contempt for the readers. Letters are really just extended leaflets in slightly different form. They, too, should be neat and attractive, with an appeal for the eye. They may be somewhat longer and may emphasize issues of interest to the entire family, such as food prices and the paycheck, safe working conditions, and so on. Like leaflets, they should open and close with strong paragraphs, deal with a limited number of topics, and advance facts in clear and simple language to lead to logical conclusions. Newsletters can be put out periodically during a campaign to keep workers informed and to sustain interest. Like leaflets and letters, their contents should be decided by the branch as a whole, and they should be produced with the same care. Producing and distributing newsletters targeted to workers in a company, industry, or region can be a good way to get people involved with a branch or organizing committee. So that's the end of that section. They're going to go on to talk about some other notes about writing, but there's a little sidebar with an anecdote. Labor organizers cannot just shoot off their mouths. I learned this the hard way in 1970, when I got busted for extortion for telling a shopping center manager that we were going to flood his center with newspaper sellers until he stopped calling the cops on us. There are many ways to say what we want to say and get away with it. For example, in a 1972 strike, one of the things workers didn't like was the boss driving equipment when he was drunk. Rather than accuse him of this, risking a harassment lawsuit for libel, our contract demands included one that the boss not drive equipment while drunk. The press got hold of it and asked the boss. He went wild calling us liars, while I simply asked how anyone could oppose a demand against drunk driving. We were not making charges or accusations, but simply demanding that it not happen in the future. There was nothing the boss could do about it. From member X326677. A word about writing. Many rank-and-file workers feel that writing is difficult, a specialized skill they can't hope to become adept at. Anyone bright enough to become an active unionist, however, can learn to write effectively. It just takes practice. Write in the same tone and voice with which you speak. If you're having trouble with a paragraph, read it aloud to see if it sounds okay. If you have a tape recorder handy, you might want to read into the mic and then sit back and see how it sounds. What doesn't sound natural to you may not be clear to others who read it either. In writing for publication, the most important thing is to stress news. A news story comes in two parts, an introduction that gives the main facts, who, what, where, when, why, and how, and perhaps an anecdote or story to grab attention, and then the rest of the article, where you develop these points. If possible, you should explain what the IWW feels should have been done or can be done about the situation and how it fits in to broader issues. Be brief and to the point, taking care to make your point clearly. If you have trouble writing what you want, stop. Say it to yourself aloud and in your own words. Write that down. If it's still not coming out, try talking about the situation to a friend or coworker. Bouncing ideas off of someone else helps to clarify them in your own mind, and they may suggest something that helps to tie the whole thing together. Be careful to be accurate. Don't write anything unless you've double-checked it. Credibility is vital in organizing. If readers find out that you're spreading rumors or that your facts aren't together, they're not likely to pay much attention to anything else you have to say, no matter how right you are. While you shouldn't underestimate people's intelligence or ability to understand things, you should also take care not to overestimate their stock of information. Clearly state any general or background information necessary to understand the story you're telling. Use identifying information such as names, places, companies, dates, tides, etc. Be specific. Avoid jargon. You should spell out names before abbreviating them. Abbreviations only make sense if you know what they mean. It's often a good idea to have someone not working on the campaign read it over to see if it makes sense to them, or if there are sections that could benefit from some rewriting. In editing, the key thing to keep in mind is clarity. Don't get hung up on a phrase or sentence. What's important is how well the article works as a whole. Check articles for the point of view they put forward and for the emphasis they place on different issues. 
If you've done heavy editing, it's only courteous to run it by the original author before printing. Distribution. As important as the production of leaflets and newsletters, of course, is getting them to the workers. Sometimes this is done through meetings, house visits, and the mail. Otherwise, you'll want to distribute them at the workplace. In either case, as much attention should go into organizing distribution as goes into putting the literature together. If you're leafleting the workplace, you may want to ask Wobblies who don't work at that job to help out, both to avoid identifying union activists to the boss unnecessarily and for logistical reasons. You don't want to be late for work, giving the boss an excuse for disciplinary action. When organizing leafleting, make sure that all shifts and entrances are covered and that you have enough leafleters on hand not to get overwhelmed by the last minute rush. Union literature cannot be distributed in working areas, except under certain conditions, generally where these have been made available as a public forum, you may have a right to post union literature on company bulletin boards, and it cannot be distributed by employees during working time. You do have an absolute right to leaflet on public sidewalks, though that won't necessarily stop the cops from arresting you, as long as you don't block the sidewalk or become involved in incidents of violence. Non-employees can generally distribute union literature on company property outside the plant, such as parking lots and entrances to the factory, only if other organizations, such as the United Way or local restaurant, are permitted such access. It's an unfair labor practice to arrest union organizers under such conditions, which doesn't always stop employers, of course. Otherwise, you can be arrested for trespassing, which is a local criminal offense though ordinarily you'll be given a warning to leave first. Employees have a legal right to distribute union literature in non-working areas, such as the parking lot, locker rooms, cafeteria, etc., during non-work time, before and after work, break periods, or mealtime. Even off-duty or laid-off workers have a clear legal right to leaflet out of doors, non-working areas, such as parking lots, owned by the company. It is illegal to fire, discipline, or arrest workers for exercising such rights. Of course, enforcing your rights is another matter. The NLRB is no more effective a defense of workers' rights in this area than in any other. The best defense, as always, is an organized workforce prepared to use its industrial power. News releases. The place of news releases in an organizing campaign largely depends upon the circumstances. In a large city, you're unlikely to get any significant mention in the daily press without a job action or some particularly outrageous violation of workers' rights by the employer. In a smaller community, where the workplace is important to the area, the local press may give the campaign more coverage, and the news release might prove an important means of informing the community and neutralizing opposition to the union. Don't overlook weekly community papers serving parts of an urban area. A good release can be like a free ad, with the paper's reputation behind it, so it should be handled carefully. History is not news, therefore a news release should be written in the future or present tense, and it should deal with an impending action or what is happening now, even if it's a response to something that happened in the past. The lead paragraph should be dramatic enough to get the reader's attention. The succeeding paragraphs should answer the questions who, what, why, where, when, and how. They should be arranged in descending order of importance so that if the story is too long, the least important part can be cut off. Again, the writing should be clear and simple. The story must be written, quote, objectively. If the paper prints it, the story becomes the paper's reporting, not yours. No paper is going to say, the X company is violently anti-union and has threatened to fire the most active organizers in the union campaign. But the paper might well say, Betty Smith, speaking for the union organizing committee, charged today that the X company is violently anti-union and has threatened to fire the most active organizers in the union campaign. Whenever you want to get an opinion into a news release, make it the opinion of some person, as distinct from the facts in the release. Be sure of your facts. If you burn the paper with stuff that isn't true, the paper will likely not print your future releases. If the paper is a weekly, Time the release so it's an up-to-date story to meet the weekly news deadline. If you give the same releases to radio or TV stations and newspapers, time them so that sometimes one will be able to release it first and sometimes another. Don't consistently favor one. 
to prepare a news release. Now, commenting, this is again from 96, so they're talking about doing this on paper. Um, some of these may apply, some might not. A lot of this is just done over email or social media now. Type the copy double-spaced on one side only of a sheet. Leave wide margins all around to allow the editor room for changes. In the top right-hand corner, place the IWW's name and the name and phone number of the person making the release. On the left, above the beginning of the story, state the time that the story can first be used. Most stories are marked for immediate release. Begin the story one-third of the way down the first page to give the editor room to write the headline and instructions to the typesetter. If you have press clips from earlier coverage, these can make the story seem more important and give reporters background information. Often, an open letter can be an effective way to place the spotlight on the boss, and a paper that won't cover you in their news columns might run it on their letters page. Don't call press conferences unless you have something really big. This is a pretentious gesture, and it takes a lot of time. If the campaign is hot news, let the reporters come to you for additional information. Be sure that whoever deals with the press is well briefed, and is able to stick to the issues that the union wants to get out. If you're not sure how to answer a question, don't. You can always offer to get back to the reporter later. Determine in advance who will speak to the press, whether in response to media inquiries, or on a picket line, or at some other public event. You should always have someone who is prepared to talk to the media and make sure that reporters are steered to that person. Otherwise, you lose all control over your message. Avoid rambling, as it can only cause problems. Know the central point that you're trying to make before talking to any reporter, and keep it simple. Few reporters will take the time to master the intricate details of a drawn-out dispute. Have some documents to back it up if possible, and stick to it. Don't get dragged off into side issues. But don't refuse to answer questions either. Redirect them to what you want to talk about. Weigh your words before speaking, with an eye both to what you're saying and how it will sound to others. And if you're being interviewed by television, think about what's going to show up on camera well. You want to look tidy, cool, collected, which is hard to do if you're being filmed on a freeway overpass with your hair blowing in your face and trucks roaring in the background. If you raise a lot of tangential issues or are careless with your facts, or start boasting about how some scabs came to a bad end, then you are inevitably going to end up looking bad in the newspaper or on the evening news. You can cry misquote or out-of-context distortion, but the damage will already have been done, and that casual boasting could come back to haunt you, not only in the form of bad press, but also in an NLRB hearing or in court. A short, focused interview minimizes the opportunities for problems. Unless you know the reporter pretty well, an hour-long conversation is a recipe for disaster. Careless wording or an idle boast can also serve as a pretext for the boss to go running off to the NLRB to claim that you're threatening unfair labor practices, or to court using your words to bolster a claim for an injunction, or to support a lawsuit for libel, extortion, racketeering, or whatever. Most such suits are mere harassment and will eventually be thrown out of court, but in the meantime, you'll have had to divert time and resources. Legal fees can mount up really fast to defending yourself. The bosses don't file these cases to win. Rather, they are trying to scare off potential supporters, bankrupt you, and divert energy from organizing. They hope to win the war, even if you win every battle in court. You can't always prevent the bosses from dragging you into court, but there's no point making it easy for them. Publicizing an ongoing campaign or a union victory, if done right, can help to boost organizing efforts and sustain morale. It can also alert workers at other shops to the IWW's existence and inspire them to consider organizing as well. So that's the end of that section. Just a comment, having a media committee or if it's a smaller campaign, a designated media person. This is a really important thing because all those media skills takes a lot of brain power to sort of rehearse and plan, and having somebody or a group of people dedicated to that is a good way to make sure that it gets done right. Whether you're doing union organizing or really kind of any kind of activism that is engaged with the public. And then there's also a sidebar here, 30 years before the NLRB. Maintenance workers at Long Island College Hospital voted for representation by SEIU Local 144 in July 1964. In May 1995, 
they were still fighting for union recognition and a contract. The hospital filed appeal after appeal with the NLRB and refused to bargain. The union won a second election in 1979 and a third in February 1995. Rather than relying on the labor board, these workers might have done better to try direct action. So that's the end of the little sidebar. The headline there is a bit confusing. Um, Obviously, 1964 was not 30 years before the NLRB, which was founded in 1935. What was 30 years before the NLRB was the founding of the IWW, which is really not clear. Actually, that sort of, um, this whole thing, you know, they talk a lot about editing and proofreading and all that kind of stuff. This uh, particular PDF really needs to be updated because it is riddled with typos. I mean, riddled. I don't know if it's an artifact of like an older, uh, you know, scanned like text to PDF kind of thing. But uh, honestly, punctuation and spelling like paper a few times comes out as Papa. Um, Somebody should go through this and do a new version of it because uh, really a lot of typos. Anyway, not to derail, but, um, you know, for me having to read every single word of this out loud, uh, this could have used the, you know, fine tooth comb treatment for sure. Anyway, continuing. Public meetings. A meeting is one of the best means of explaining the union to the entire workforce, answering questions and encouraging discussion and communication among all employees about the campaign. The discussion can be a valuable guide in planning organizing strategy, but a public meeting is an uncertain undertaking. A good meeting can really help a campaign, but a poor one, attended by only a few silent spectators, can kill it. Before deciding to hold a public meeting, consider the atmosphere of the drive. Will many workers be sufficiently interested to attend? Do they live close enough to each other to be able to attend without transportation difficulties? Will they be sufficiently unafraid to take part in questions and discussion? Do many of the contacts and supporters outside of the job branch want a meeting? How many could get their families to come and find out what the campaign is all about? What possible chance is there of reprisals against participants? What do you hope to accomplish with the meeting? If you're not reasonably sure of success, don't plan a meeting. Comment. In other words, a bad meeting is much worse than no meeting at all. Much better not to have a meeting than to have a bad one. In other words, when you have a meeting, you kind of want it to also be a rally and help with the momentum. So if it's not going to do that, better not to have one. Continuing. If you do decide to hold a meeting, work as hard as you can to fill the hall. Don't use company premises even if you can get permission. Get a proper size hall, better small and crowded than large and empty. Get out plenty of good publicity and encourage families to attend. Plan for child care if necessary. Plan a good program, beginning with a poised, firm chairperson who can handle hecklers and keep control of the meeting. Choose the speakers to represent various elements of the workforce. Keep the speeches short, informative, and honest. Leave plenty of time for questions and discussions from the floor, and close the meeting before people are tired of it. Have some good union literature on display for people to take home. Maybe several smaller meetings would be better than a large meeting of the entire workforce. Some people find it easier to talk and ask questions in a small group of acquaintances. Consider breaking down the meetings into shifts and or departments. Maybe several small meetings in private homes would be better attended than a large one. If the group is small and their homes are scattered, workers may prefer to meet right after work in a restaurant or bar down the street. Many of these have rooms available to give the group needed privacy. Small meetings can be run informally, but they should all be planned to include a good speaker who can explain the union, plenty of time for questions and discussion, and union literature to take home. Community Attitudes Sometimes, particularly in a small community where a handful of employers dominate economic and civic life, employers may well try to use prominent community people or a front organization to establish an atmosphere hostile to the union and thus indirectly influence workers. If the workplace is a hospital or other essential public service, be prepared for hysterical charges that a union would have dangerous power because of the critical services its members render. But don't have too many preconceived notions about how the community will react. Be alert for how it actually is reacting. In 1954, during the big campaign for state, quote, right-to-work legislation, which barred union shops, 
The Machinists' Union published a pamphlet, Right to Work Laws, Three Moral Studies. It contains articles by a rabbi, a priest, and a minister defending the union shop and the right to organize on moral and ethical grounds. This is an excellent pamphlet for people outside the union movement. You might try to find it or comparable material and prepare a package for distribution explaining unionism in this way. Such material can often be found in your library under, quote, right to work. Comment there. So there's this term, union shop. What does that mean? So basically, there are kind of four possible statuses with regard to unions within a workplace. The closed shop was a type of workplace where employees had to be a member of the union in order to get hired. The IWW actually used to use the slogan, an open union and a closed shop. Basically, they wanted to organize all workplaces into the IWW so that the IWW controlled employment. And again, this is about taking power away from the owners and managers and putting it towards the unionized workers. So the open union part meant that they wouldn't discriminate against anybody. They would take any worker in as far as the membership goes. And then the closed shop meant that you couldn't get work without joining the union because they didn't want unorganized workers being used against the union. But really take seriously the open union part because that was not always the case. Sometimes you would have a closed shop and a closed union, meaning you couldn't get work unless you joined the union. But if you were black or et cetera, et cetera, you wouldn't be allowed to join the union and then you wouldn't be allowed to do any legit work. So that's the closed shop. Now, in 1947, with the Taft-Hartley Act, a major piece of anti-labor legislation, this was fundamental to the Cold War and the general assault that would begin on the U.S. left in that post-war period, the closed shop was no longer provided for. So there are three other statuses. The union shop, which is the most similar to the closed shop. However, in the case of the union shop, you don't have to be a union member at the time of hiring, but there is like a specific period of time that you have before you have to join the union eventually. After that, there is the agency shop where you don't have to join the union, but you do have to pay dues to it since basically it is negotiating on your behalf, even if you're not a member of it because you're in the collective bargaining unit that it represents. Finally, there is the open shop where neither membership nor dues payments can be compelled. So U.S. right to work laws, which is just an overt assault on the socialist concept of the right to work, the right to a decent living. What those laws do is with the closed shop now outlawed federally, it opens the door for on a state by state basis, outlawing the union and agency shop, just basically making an environment with open shops only. Okay, hopefully that's enough background. Continuing, if community attitudes seem likely to have an effect on your organizing efforts, try to secure personal interviews with prominent professional people to explain the organizing campaign, the legal right to organize, and the moral imperative to respect the right of workers to make their decision free from outside coercion. Don't expect a public statement endorsing the organizing campaign, but if you can get a public statement calling for a free election, and respect for the right of the employees, you will have gained an important point. As the campaign progresses, if you find reasonable community acceptance, you may want to air the subject on radio talk shows. Have several people prepared to call in with their own pro-union views, no canned stuff, so that the station isn't immediately deluged with a string of anti-union calls. Don't forget the religious, ethnic, and racial organizations to which many workers may belong. The closer an organization is tied to workers' outside lives, the more important it is that that organization should understand and hopefully support what the workers are trying to accomplish. Pastors, rabbis, and priests of working-class congregations have frequently supported the labor struggles of their communicants. The Employer's Reaction to the Campaign the old-fashioned employer who used to confront a union organizing campaign head-on with bluster and threats has generally become more sophisticated. Large firms bring in their own labor relations experts, and small firms usually hire them. In either case, the campaign against the union is smooth, 
produced by professionals who spend their whole working lives as anti-union experts. I'm just going to read that again. In either case, the campaign against the union is smooth, produced by professionals who spend their whole working lives as anti-union experts. So remember, that is what you're going to be up against. Don't let it intimidate you out of doing it, but keep that in mind. These anti-union campaigns are often intended to disarm employees rather than to intimidate them, although in recent years, veiled and not so veiled threats to shut down and move to another state or another country if workers don't toe the line have become increasingly common. Comment there. Walmart is a great example of this. Just do a web search on Walmart shutdown store union. They have done this many times. If a store is threatening to go union, or it actually does, and they'll get dinged by the NLRB for it, and they will do it anyway. They would rather shut down a store than have unions spread as a culture within Walmart. Employers are used to, and prefer, labor relations board elections. Whether the job branch wishes to subject itself to this drawn-out, legalistic process is for the members to decide. It is possible, even legal, to fight for specific demands or even to demand union recognition without going through the NLRB. I just want to make another comment here. Um, basically, when we talk about the right to organize, there is something called protected concerted activity. What this states is that U.S. workers have the right to confront employers, I mean, confront is a strong word, but, you know, approach and discuss with employers conditions, whether it's pay, whether it's safety, whatever it is, on behalf of not just themselves, but at least one other employee. So there are limits to what is considered protected activity. For example, it can't be maliciously harmful, slanderous, libelous, etc. But as long as it's truthful and in good faith, etc., um, there is a lot of activity that is considered protected concerted activity, as long as it's not just for yourself, but at least one other coworker as well. We'll probably cover this more in a live stream. Anyway, continuing. It is essential that you have solid majority support, preferably paid up membership, before seeking union recognition. Some employers may try to defeat an organizing attempt by staging a rigged straw vote or calling for an NLRB election before the union has gained majority support. When you have a solid majority, the time has come to demand union recognition. This can be done through a certified letter stating that a majority of workers have designated the union as their collective bargaining agent and requesting that the employer recognize and agree to bargain with the union. But it might be better to let the employer know in a more direct fashion, perhaps by having the workforce visit and tell them so as a body. The boss may want to verify the union's majority status, but under no circumstances should you turn over the names of union supporters. Instead, offer to submit membership cards to a neutral party for verification of the union's majority. Don't be surprised if the employer refuses to recognize you. Comment. I think that this is the situation in most cases. Employers will pretty much take any tactic that they can to drag this out, including just petty stalling like that. There are essentially three ways to gain union recognition. Voluntary recognition, independent election, or NLRB election. Any of these means of obtaining recognition has equal legal weight. Voluntary recognition includes situations where the employer, verbally or in writing, accepts the union's claim to represent a majority of employees or agrees to have a neutral third party verify the union's majority status through a card check. Again, that's seeing that a majority of people have signed authorization cards for the union. Assuming, of course, that a majority is found. Even if the boss only recognizes the union as the result of a strike or some other job action, it is still considered voluntary comment. So even if you have sort of, uh, not coerced, but, you know, used an action to sort of make them say uncle, uh, that's still voluntary recognition. So one other comment about card check. So we have discussed this in live streams and other commentaries before, but basically the Democratic Party, uh, which pretends to be a friend of labor round the clock, it's pretty much their job. They've been saying for a long time that they would pass, quote, card check legislation although they've kind of backed off on that more recently. Basically, what card check legislation would do 
is it would force voluntary, well, it wouldn't be voluntary, but it would force recognition if you get a majority, 50% plus one, simple majority, of A cards signed in a bargaining unit. In other words, if an election were held that day, would it go through? Then you don't have to wait for the election. So that's card check. If you can present a majority of your, the proposed bargaining unit having signed A cards, it would just, there wouldn't be, you know, you have to wait six to eight weeks for an election, all that kind of stuff. It would just be check the cards. If there's a majority, boom, you have a union and the employer has no right to reject, deny, stall, etc. The employer would just have to recognize it. Anyway, continuing. If the employer refuses voluntary recognition, the union has several options. A brief strike or other job action may be just the thing to bring your boss around. Alternately, the union may wish to propose an election to be conducted by a neutral third party, not the government, to establish majority support for the IWW. This has the advantage of sidestepping the NLRB and its delays, ensuring that the question of majority support can be quickly settled without recourse to a job action, which might be worthwhile in situations such as a hospital where community support is deemed necessary and might be alienated through what could be portrayed as a frivolous strike and without giving the boss time to whittle away at your majority. Faced with a demand for union recognition, however, most employers will insist on an election held by the National Labor Relations Board or a state board, whichever has jurisdiction. Comment, not every state, last I checked, has a state equivalent of the NLRB. Many do, some don't. Ostensibly, this will be for the workers' protection to be sure that they are not being coerced into the union. Actually, it's a delaying tactic to give the employer time to win them back, or alternately, to intimidate them. You cannot be compelled to agree to an NLRB election. However, it is illegal to picket for union recognition for more than 30 days without filing for an NLRB election. Comment, this is from about 25 years ago. I would just double check on that particularity. Purely informational picketing or picketing aimed at improving wages or conditions i.e. not for union recognition, having gained union recognition voluntarily or through an independent election, is another question entirely. The decision on how to proceed, should the employer refuse to recognize the union, must be made by the job branch, taking into consideration the level of support for job action. If you decide to go with the NLRB, you might do well to talk to a friendly attorney first, IWW headquarters, might know someone in your neck of the woods. Otherwise, check with the local National Lawyers Guild or with local movement groups for someone who might be willing to offer some free advice to get the lay of the land. In filing for recognition, the union is required to define the bargaining unit it seeks to represent. The employer may refuse to agree that it is a, quote, appropriate bargaining unit and can try to force the matter to a formal NLRB hearing. This will automatically delay the election several months and the NLRB has a tendency to favor multi-plant bargaining units and splitting skilled workers off from the rest of the workforce. You should be prepared to respond to charges that the IWW is not a bona fide union. In Canada, an IWW construction local was once refused bargaining rights because a labor board hearing officer ruled that the IWW preamble proved that they did not seek harmonious relations with the bosses. In Los Angeles, an employer similarly tried to quote the IWW preamble a few years ago to, quote, prove them a, quote, communist organization rather than a labor union. This sort of nonsense is easily refuted. IWW headquarters can provide abundant documentation from the NLRB, the U.S. Labor Department, etc., recognizing their status as a union. If someone gives you grief over the preamble, you might respond with quotes from old craft union constitutions, or the AFL's old constitutional preamble which delineated the class character of the economic system. They dumped the preamble when they merged with the CIO. And at root, of course, this sort of red-baiting charge is an attack not on our status as a labor union, but rather on our right to advocate our views, and as such represents a violation of our right to freedom of speech. Contrary to the official liberal labor myth, the right to organize and bargain collectively was not written into Section 7A of the National Recovery Act and subsequently the Wagner Act of 1935 out of a love for labor. Rather, that legislation was passed to contain labor's growing rebellion and to undermine labor's increasing realization of its own economic strength. 
The Taft-Hartley Act, passed in 1947, and the Landrum-Griffin Act, passed in 1959, were both specifically designed to further shackle labor's economic strength and solidarity. Therefore, while you may occasionally encounter sympathetic examiners and attorneys in regional NLRB offices, you're being governed here by a hostile body of law. Besides the election itself, all sorts of other delaying tactics are possible under the law. In filing for recognition, the union is required to define the bargaining unit it seeks to represent. The employer may refuse to agree to that as a, quote, appropriate bargaining unit. If the union and employer cannot reach agreement, the NLRB will hold a formal hearing to determine the bargaining unit. Automatically, this will delay the election for perhaps several months. The NLRB has a penchant for multi-plant bargaining units, which cannot be democratically administered in most cases, and for splitting craft workers off from the rest of the workforce. Both are, of course, unacceptable. History indicates that strikes or other job action can change both the employer's and the NLRB's minds. Before insisting on a formal NLRB hearing, the union should consider carefully what will do the least damage to the campaign. The concessions demanded by the employer in defining the bargaining unit, which can be overturned through direct action, or the delay that the hearing will cause. The employer is prohibited from committing unfair labor practices, such as the wholesale firing of union supporters during the organizing campaign. But suppose the employer ignores the law and does those things. The union can file charges of unfair labor practices with the NLRB. The election will then be postponed until the charges can be heard and decided. As all decisions can be appealed up to the national board, this could easily delay the election for a year or more. Employers may even try to bait unions into filing charges through provocative actions. This really gives the union the choice of letting the employer run roughshod over workers' rights or trying to force the employer to obey the law already biased in their favor, and having the election postponed indefinitely. If you go the election's route, it's often best to document and save the unfair labor practice charges until after the election, and file them only if the election is lost. It's very difficult to hold a group together during long delays, so it may be better to overlook provocation and proceed with the election. The NLRB can be of assistance, particularly when the bosses have started to fire union activists and you're trying to pick up the pieces, but it can also screw you and no IWW campaign has ever succeeded which relied on labor law as its primary weapon. Many a charge has been filed with the NLRB, resulting in a sweeping legal, quote, victory five or seven years down the road. By that time, the union has almost certainly been busted and most union supporters have moved on to another job. A few such, quote, victories, and there won't be a union left to celebrate them. If no hearings or charges delay it, the election will be set perhaps a month ahead. During that time, the employer will try to undermine the union in various ways, including one, attacking the union as an outsider, attempting to capitalize on an unfortunate situation, such as temporary slump in the market. The workplace is a big family, and if there are misunderstandings, they should be settled within the family. 2. Playing on people's sympathies for a decent supervisor. Supervisors are management's frontline troops in the battle against unionization, whether willingly or not. 3. Claiming that the union will destroy opportunities for advancement. Quote, we want to reward deserving employees, but the union won't let us. 4. Charge that the union will impose arbitrary fees and fines and force workers to strike. 5. Claiming that the company really would like to raise wages and improve benefits, but its financial conditions simply won't permit such generosity. Unreasonable coercion by outsiders may force the company to cut back on production, payroll, and so on, or to relocate the facility in another area. So, comment, depending on how that's worded, that can definitely be an unfair labor practice. So, if they merely say, we can't afford it, blah, 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 and it could cause the company to go under... That probably isn't. But if they say, you know, my grandfather founded this company and he said he'd rather die than see it go union and we'll close, you can't make that kind of threat. That's an unfair labor practice. I mean, you can't make it legally. Of course, they do make it all the time. I was just talking about Walmart. But anyway, continuing. Six, red baiting. In responding to this, stress that both the IWW as a whole and the particular job branch at that workplace are democratic open, nonviolent, and unconnected to any party or government. 
but don't try to deny the evident facts or become defensive about it. 7. Claiming that union dues are a financial burden. Although IWW dues are low and union workers on average earn much more, 20% more, than non-organized workers. 8. Exploiting fears of bureaucratic control and loss of individuality. Again, stress the IWW's democratic character and protections against bureaucracy. Comment. I would say that for most workers, uh, as far as the fear of bureaucratic control, loss of individuality, it depends what union you're with, but probably even the potentially minimal amount of democracy that you would experience through a union is going to be like a revolutionary step forward for you in terms of your overall experience with workplaces or probably institutions generally. People in the U.S., the average working person really does not have much meaningful power to decide in anything beyond just what product to buy. And really having any kind of ability to weigh in on stuff at work is like a massive breath of fresh air. In fact, it can really change your whole outlook on what is possible. So, Nine, attempting to split workers by introducing a more, quote, respectable union like the AFL-CIO as a competitor. Stress the advantages here of IWW representation. If the boss's support for the business union is obvious, you might point out that the boss evidently prefers that union, thinking that it will do their bidding. An organizing success story. Each organizing drive has its own little peculiarities, and you have to choose your tactics to fit the situation. There's no formula which will work under all circumstances. I think the best we can do is to share our experiences and let you and your fellow workers pick and choose what will work for you. So here's mine. I was involved in organizing the University Cellar Bookstore in 1978. It was an alternative store in many ways. Many workers were idealists, hoping to provide a real service to the community. But the management lost sight of that early on. When I got there, the store was three years old with about 70 employees. Wages were low, and the amount of worker involvement in decision-making, which had been high at the beginning, was declining. We tried five organizing drives over the next six years before we were finally successful. So comment. That's what I was saying before. Um, organizing is tough, and you may not succeed. It may take many tries. Do everything you can, but sometimes conditions really are just not good, and you just got to wait for a different season, so to speak. Continuing. So I guess my first bit of advice is to be patient and keep trying in spite of setbacks. The next is be a good hard worker. If you're upfront about what you're trying to do in terms of organizing, and I think you'll be more effective if you are upfront about it, the bosses might want to get rid of you. If they fire you for organizing, you have a shot at getting back wages and reinstatement after a long process of dealing with the NLRB. If you're breaking any work rules, that will be the excuse that they use for firing you. And your chances of winning are less. So comment, we could maybe summarize this as the price of being a union activist is also having to be a model employee. It may not be fair, but it's the tightrope that you have to walk due to the imbalance of power in the workplace and a responsible organizer accepts that responsibility. Continuing, rational bosses, there may be one or two, will realize that they risk alienating other workers by firing someone who does a good job. Another reason for having a good work record is to win over any workers who are pro-management or concerned that unionizing might jeopardize their livelihoods. They're more likely to trust an organizer whose work record shows that they aren't the sort who would do anything which might put the source of their livelihood out of business. In the successful drive, we put out a weekly photocopied newsletter. Even before we started the drive, it was a way to air our grievances. After a few issues, we started getting feedback from other workers. We encouraged, even nagged workers with grievances to write them up for the newsletter, and we accepted submissions from any non-management worker. So the paper became a forum for debate, but more and more it became a union paper as we won more and more workers to our side. We started talking union pointing out that if we unionized, we could set up work rules the workers agreed to rather than just accepting rules handed down by the bosses. We could negotiate a contract which protected the things we liked about the job and changed the things we hated. And we started signing people up in the IWW rather than just getting signatures for an NLRB election. It gave the workers a sense of doing something, of solidarity, rather than just the liberal feeling you get when you sign a petition. 
and it helped to build a core of workers we could count on to support action on the shop floor, even if another union had come in or we had lost the organizing drive. We held weekly meetings, open to all non-management workers, to talk about tactics. It made it difficult to do anything very secretive. Snitches, who later took jobs in management, were present and no doubt ran back to the bosses with reports. But it was important not to alienate people on the fence, most of whom eventually fell off on the union side. One worker who didn't want any union challenged us for signing people up in the IWW. So one meeting focused on the choice of a union. Those of us with bad experiences and other unions ran them down at the meeting. We emphasized that the IWW would support us while leaving us alone to negotiate a contract and run our business as we wanted, rather than be one more boss like other unions usually are. The workers who had already signed up were solid in wanting the IWW, so it won handily. As one worker who initially opposed organizing wrote in our newsletter just before the NLRB election, quote, the IWW is cheap, it's democratic, and it's us. For those workers with the delusion that workers and bosses were all just one big happy family, we pointed out that we weren't hostile towards our liberal boss and department managers, but that we wanted to be able to negotiate from a position of equality rather than just accepting what was handed down paternalistically, no matter how benevolent it might have been. When management started red baiting, I wrote a satire in the newsletter saying yes indeed, the devil from IWW headquarters had flown in on his broom with orders to organize and we were blindly following along. It was absurd enough to make all the workers laugh and the bosses back off. Before we went to management for union recognition, we signed up two-thirds of the workers. They wouldn't recognize us, so we petitioned the NLRB for an election. We started pulling job actions in the meantime, brief song breaks for a few verses of Solidarity Forever in the store during business hours with new lyrics which fit our situation, leaflets to the customers telling them what we were doing and encouraging them to express their support to management, lots of workers wearing union buttons, t-shirts, and caps and willing to take time to explain why to customers. Make it clear to management that you aren't going away, and they might as well recognize you and negotiate, so they don't have to deal with the day-to-day -day direct actions. When we had the NLRB election, we maintained the same percentage of workers as those we had signed up in the union. You usually lose a lot with authorization cards, so if you're going that route, make sure you have a strong majority before you go for an election. Hopefully the boss will face reality when you show the list of members and dealing with the NLRB won't be necessary. It's a long, tedious, bureaucratic process. If most workers are militant, you can strike for recognition. That speeds up the process. But workers are often worried about getting fired or losing wages. I found that actions on the job are less threatening to them. So comment there. A lot of people who are not very familiar with unions and job actions, you know, industrial actions as they're sometimes called, just think of strikes. But there's a lot of things short of a work stoppage that organized workers can do. Get creative. Continuing, being open is best. If some of you are willing to be upfront about what you're doing and you don't get fired, it will encourage others to stand up too. Of course, if you do get fired, it could have the opposite effect. Until you're ready to go to the boss for recognition and start negotiating, I'd suggest that you let the more timid among you join up, but keep their membership secret. Tell them that you aren't going to let management know who's involved until you have the weight of a clear majority and the law behind you. Get them as involved as you can, but give them the room to grow at their own pace. Sources of Labor Law In the U.S., most labor law is federal. The National Labor Relations Act limits your rights to form unions and to bring effective pressure to bear against your employer to win your demands. But the NLRA does not cover local and state government employees, farm workers, domestic workers, and some other workers. Airline and railroad workers are covered by a separate federal law. In most states, public sector workers are covered by state public employee laws modeled after the NLRA. California is among the handful of states with laws covering agricultural workers. Uncovered workers retain their rights to strike for recognition or over grievances, to call for secondary boycotts, etc. The Fair Labor Standards Act limits child labor in most industries. Notable exceptions are farm labor and newspaper delivery. It requires employers to pay a minimum wage and requires overtime pay when workers work more than 40 hours in a week. Most, but not all, workers are covered. 
The U.S. Labor Department is charged with enforcing the law. Most states have parallel state laws and agencies, some of which offer broader protections. The Occupational Safety and Health Act requires employers to meet minimal safety standards, entitles you to information as to toxic substances you're working with, and prohibits retaliation against workers for filing OSHA complaints. Other federal laws regulate pension plans, prohibit discrimination on race or sex grounds, require employers to provide unpaid leave during personal or family medical emergencies, etc. State laws govern worker compensation claims if you get injured on the job, and sometimes they go beyond federal laws in limiting child labor. Over time, in Illinois, for example, you cannot be asked to work more than 13 days in a row, though the state has waived this in a recent IWW campaign, etc. Some states restrict employers, quote, right to fire workers without cause, or they offer protections against harassment beyond those available through federal civil rights law. Many states also have laws governing access to personnel records, employee privacy, and related issues. Most states have agencies to help workers collect unpaid wages. Comment, that happened to me once. I was working at a place that went out of business and my last few paychecks bounced. I was able to recover the money through the use of the state labor department. Continuing, most states have agencies to help workers collect unpaid wages. Some states have laws against the importation of scabs, i.e. workers brought in to break a strike, although these are rarely enforced. Information on applicable state laws can be obtained from the State Department of Labor. Handbooks on state labor law are sometimes available as well. And commenting, do check around on your state if you have one, your state's uh, Department of Labor or whatever it is. Um, sometimes they have interesting and useful resources. You know, not everybody there is an anti-labor, mindless bureaucrat. Some people do go to work for the Department of Labor, you know, out of an actual interest in this kind of thing. They may have previously been union activists, things like that. So you may actually find some pamphlets and PDFs that pertain to your situation and might teach you a thing or two about working in your state and what your rights are. Part 4. The Union's Response Don't be put on the defensive, spending all your time answering the employer's attacks. Make your own positive statements containing the facts that the employer is distorting. Deal with specific abuses and demands in a reasonable tone. Avoid the kind of attacks on the employer which can generate sympathy for the underdog. Rabid personal attacks on the boss won't persuade anyone. Better point out that employers have different interests, interests that conflict with those of the workers. Emphasize the union's program. Let workers find out for themselves how fair the employer is. Coupled with arguments against the union, the employer will often try to bribe workers with wage raises, correction of grievances, and improvement of the workplace environment. These concessions are responses to the present or potential strength of the workers and the threat which unionization poses. These bribes are also unfair labor practices, according to the law, but the union certainly can't oppose them. Rather, it should anticipate them and prepare workers for these bribes. The union should point out that the employer's actions show how much they are prepared to give to avoid having to deal with the union. This proves the union's contention that workers can really gain through organization. Greater gains can be anticipated with union recognition and collective bargaining. Stay one jump ahead of the employer. Plan your strategy like a chess game. If the union does or says this, the management's counterattack will likely be that. Don't get caught flat-footed. In spite of your excellent program, you won't encourage confidence in the union if management makes you look like a bunch of dummies. Warn workers to expect bribes and threats from the employer, not because management is mean or malicious, but because it just doesn't want the union for valid, from its standpoint, economic reasons, i.e. its class interests. By anticipating the employer's moves, you can greatly minimize the damage that they do. Informational picketing. Informational picketing is directed at consumers, not at employees of a workplace or other sympathetic workers. The goal might be, for example, to educate shoppers regarding working conditions at a store. Workers are not asked to refuse to cross informational picket lines, and it is not considered a violation of union principles to work behind these lines. Many unionists believe that informational picketing, when union people are still on the job behind the lines, confuses the public and diminishes the significance of a picket line. Therefore, they're reluctant to use this tactic. But in some organizing situations, informational picketing might be considered, one, 
If the employer directly serves consumers who would be sympathetic to the union and refuse to patronize the establishment, so the employer would really be hurt economically. Two, if the union has formally demanded and been refused recognition. Three, if you're going the NLRB route and there's a long interval before the election. Four, if the weather, available pickets, hours of business, and location of the employer's premises will not make picketing too much of a hardship. And if you are very, very sure that you can keep it up at full strength until you win your point. If these factors are not all present, don't try it. If you do pick it, failure to gain recognition could damage morale. You can't afford to let the employer win such a skirmish. Should the employer start firing union activists in the midst of a campaign, before you've built up the strength to carry out an effective job action, an informational picket might be just the thing. Striking for recognition. A strike for recognition is serious business, and it should not be ventured unless you have no other alternative or are sure of success, in which case you might want to consider going beyond mere recognition to demand better wages and conditions. There are legal implications to such a move, though. You may forfeit rights to get the NLRB to order rehiring should the strike be declared an unfair labor practice and be defeated. Of course, if you're really certain of winning, this may be irrelevant. Suppose the employer fires one or more key activists in the organizing drive. If the union ignores this provocation and doesn't support the activists, it will lose workers' respect and trust. Here is an urgent situation that can't wait until after an NLRB election. Maybe you should strike. There are, again, legal implications. If you restrict the strike to union recognition or unfair labor practices, it should not significantly affect the NLRB elections process scabs hired after the strike began would not be eligible to vote. Evaluate carefully the economic impact of a strike on the employer. If you strike, you should strike to win. The NLRB ruses really matter only if you lose. Be sure of your strength. Most unions won't strike with less than a two-thirds strike vote, and you will need at least that much solid support. If you are sure you can win, strike. A strike is war. Go into it with all your intelligence, energy, and resources. Use your imagination. Whatever strategy you choose, be creative. If you use the same tactics over and over, the bosses will learn how to respond. Better to do the unexpected and keep them off balance. Avoid long, drawn-out strikes wherever possible. Better to pull back and return to work without conceding defeat and try on-the-job tactics and regroup for another day than to allow the bosses to get all the union supporters off the job and off the payroll. If you are forced into a long strike, develop means to help strikers keep food on their tables and a roof over their heads. Talk to other unions, look for short-term casual jobs for strikers, organize a solidarity committee to help people deal with the inevitable crises. So we're thinking here about strike funds, donations, drives, whatever is needed. In a strike situation that lasts more than a day or two, it's important to get a strike newsletter out to all striking workers. Encourage strikers to write their own stories and observations. Involve as many people as possible. Provide accurate, up-to-date information on negotiations, solidarity, and how the strike is impacting the company. Make sure to send strikers to talk to other unions, teamsters and other workers who make deliveries and pickups, and anyone else in a position to show some effective solidarity to develop that solidarity. The more pressure you can bring to bear quickly, the sooner you can win your point. A competing union. Suppose you're in a three-way NLRB election with the IWW, another union, and no union all on the ballot. It may be tempting to turn your attack on the other union. This is generally not a good idea though. Workers aren't half as interested in jurisdictional warfare as they are in how a union can improve their jobs. Ignore the other union and concentrate on explaining your program. Attack the boss, the class enemy, rather than sincere bureaucrats and fellow workers who comprise or support the other union. No employer really wants any union on the premises, but sometimes employers, recognizing that unionization is inevitable and preferring accommodation and peaceful coexistence, favor the business union that intervenes in an IWW election. If this is the case, Emphasize the basic premise that only a union recognizing the fact of the class struggle can be effective. If the employer prefers the other union, the IWW must be best for the workers. Do workers want an organization of their own, 
or the one that the company believes it can dominate. A majority of votes cast is necessary to win an NLRB election. If no proposition receives a majority, a runoff will be held between the two highest. Suppose that the runoff is between the two unions. The same principle applies. Concentrate on your own program and don't initiate an attack on the other union. If the other union attacks you, keep the reply low key and make the point clear that this is a class war, not a jurisdictional war. Never accuse the other union of selling out unless you have absolute proof. The key objective to keep in mind is the need to build effective solidarity on the job floor, to build the basis for effective industrial action. This requires that you keep your sight on the real enemy, no matter how irritating the other union may be. But suppose that the runoff is between the other union and no union. Which do you choose? Which will make the job better? Which offers the best hope for sustaining the job branch and eventually winning majority support? Should you stand aside or throw your support to the other union? This will take a hard look in each individual campaign. The other union, if it wins, will negotiate a contract requiring all workers to join it in order to keep their jobs. There's always the danger that it may turn a blind eye to the employer's efforts to get rid of IWW activists. Once it's certified by the government, dumping an unsatisfactory union or getting out from under a worthless contract is immensely difficult. In the long run, you may well be better off without a business union entrenched on the job. Should you decide that a business union is better than an unorganized job, try to reach some sort of agreement guaranteeing certain rights for IWW members on the job. Whatever the decision, you need to maintain an IWW presence on the job. IWW members on any job are leaven in the loaf. They help to win and keep good conditions on the job and to make business unions as effective and democratic as possible. And a visible wobbly presence serves as a reminder of what's possible, laying the groundwork for future organizing efforts. Sometimes you may be organizing a job where another union already has collective bargaining rights. In this situation, you need to carefully consider both what function that union actually plays on the job and how it is perceived by your fellow workers. If the other union is actively working as a tool of the employing class, and you can prove it, it probably makes sense to point this out. But the focus of your campaign should still be aimed at the enemy, the employers, and the battle to wrest better conditions on the job. Timing during the campaign. An important point to keep in mind throughout the organizing campaign is timing. The employer is much more vulnerable during busy periods when there's a lot of work. In general, it's not a good idea to strike in the midst of layoffs or when the employer has a large inventory on hand. Under such circumstances, workers are easily replaced or starved back to work. When seeking voluntary union recognition, it's best to approach the employer when they're most vulnerable and thus they have little choice but to accept the union. Similar considerations apply in single-issue campaigns. Employers generally try to force confrontations on their own timetable when they have the best chance to win. If the employer is clearly trying to provoke workers into a strike, careful attention should be given to other options, in particular to direct action on the job. Direct action is most effective when intelligently applied. A great deal can be won by an organized workforce that acts at the right moment to strike, to slow down, or to refuse to tolerate unacceptable conditions any longer. Momentum is also important in a campaign. Frustration and despair can easily set in, eroding your base of support, particularly during the final stages of a campaign. This is one of the reasons employers prefer working through the NLRB, and so they frequently avail themselves of the opportunities it offers for delays. Keep in personal touch with union supporters, a union picnic or social, a union button day, a victory, even a small one on the shop floor. All these can help keep up morale and keep the organizing drive on track. NLRB elections. Should the job branch decide to go the NLRB route, timing slips from your control. The board, not the union, decides when the election will be held, subject to the employer's delaying tactics. During the intervening period, the union has to maintain its support Continue efforts to win over the uncommitted, you will lose some votes through turnover, illness, fringe, and employer pressure, and work to line up new employees. Once the election date is set, the campaign has to be carefully planned to peak just before the election. You have two major tasks, 
to hold your majority with your own positive program and to anticipate and counter the employer's campaign. The employer may well wait until just before the election, before their big move. Most union campaigns are lost in the final day or two before the vote. Expect a captive meeting held during working hours or a devastating letter to confuse everyone. Time your last mass contact before election day so as to best offset the employer's expected move. In other words, it's like the workplace equivalent of the October surprise. Warn workers that the employer may try to stampede them at the last minute against their considered judgment. Have a telephone system ready to activate after the employer's last shot to try to win back those whom the employer may have influenced and talk with as many union supporters as possible. Shortly before the election, the job branch will need to elect union observers. These should be firm union supporters respected by their fellow workers. The job branch should make detailed plans to get out every union vote. Have transportation and child care available. Divide up the responsibility for seeing that people get to the polls. If more than one shift is involved, use the off shift for telephoning and transportation while the polls are open. Check off the union supporters as they vote and contact those who have not voted before it's too late. Contact the absentees from work to arrange a way for them to vote. Get out every union vote you can. Even if you're assured of a majority, the bigger the win, the more credible your strike threat in the coming negotiations. Now, suppose that you lose the election. It happens to unions with far more resources at hand than the IWW every day. The business unions preach the conventional wisdom that if an NLRB election is lost, the campaign's over, perhaps to be revived at a later date if the potential dues base is attractive enough. Their organizers pack up and go away, and their funds and resources are withdrawn. The IWW, however, doesn't base its hopes on the NLRB and NLRB elections. We see the loss of an NLRB election as only a temporary setback. Should you be defeated, take a long look at the campaign to see why workers voted against the union. If you can figure that out, you may be able to regain your majority. The main consequence of losing an NLRB election is that it gives the employer a ready-made excuse to refuse to deal with the union. The job branch is now more important than ever. You need your strength to try to protect union activists and other workers from discrimination and to try to win improvements through on-the-job action. If management is smart, it will treat workers well for a while. If not, a situation may arise around which you can organize and win a single-issue campaign, laying the groundwork for once again seeking union recognition. Organizing, a long-term process. Organizing is a long-term process. It requires patience and months or years of groundwork. Let me say that again. Organizing requires patience and months or years of groundwork. While it is often possible to win some immediate improvements fairly quickly, establishing a permanent union presence on the job takes time. The myth of the professional organizer blowing into town, giving a few speeches, handing out some leaflets, calling a meeting, and leading the workers out on strike is just that, a myth. No lasting union was ever built on such a flimsy foundation. Unions cannot be built with smoke and mirrors. It takes work and perseverance. You need to have the patience to listen to your fellow workers and speak to their concerns. If they're not ready to join the union, find out what they might be ready to do and start from there. Maybe a petition against some particularly obnoxious supervisor. Maybe a demand that some dangerous work area be cleaned up, whatever. The point is to get people accustomed to working together around their common grievances, and of course, to get those grievances taken care of. Sometimes people are ready to move, and they flock to join the union. More often, it takes time and work. Don't be discouraged if your first or second effort doesn't succeed. Learn from it and move ahead. And remember, even unsuccessful organizing drives usually leave better conditions behind in their wake. The trick is to demonstrate that those improvements weren't the result of the boss waking up one morning and deciding to be nice, but rather they were a response to your organized efforts to win better conditions. The point of production. We've talked about various mechanics of putting an organization together, union structure, obtaining recognition, and so forth. But a union is going to live or die based upon how effective it is at exploiting the employer's weaknesses. 
At all times throughout the organizing campaign, you must be on the lookout for opportunities to let the employer know how much they depend upon an efficient workforce in order to get things done. You and your fellow workers are on the job every day, and you control many aspects of the work. The process of the work itself is vulnerable to worker control and disruption, just as it moves efficiently only when workers are responsive to the needs of that process. Look around you. Figure out where the bottlenecks in production are, which processes are most vulnerable, how your particular workplace interacts with other workplaces. What is your boss's likely reaction to a work stoppage or slowdown? Could they farm the work out to another facility? What sort of communications and transportation links do they have with other employers or with distributors? Where do the products go? Who are the major suppliers, particularly for vital materials? What's the most likely pool of strike breakers? At which points in the production process would a slowdown or stoppage be most immediately felt? A Worker's Guide to Direct Action, published by the IWW, is a good source for ideas. Jobs are usually covered by a bunch of rules, standing orders, and regulations which are ignored, since workers who obey all the rules can't actually get much work done. Perhaps you should consider scrupulously obeying the company's rules or relevant laws. This is called working to rule. Service workers often find that they may end up hurting consumers more than the bosses by using some of the tactics that work in, say, manufacturing. One way around this is to provide the public with better or cheaper service at the boss's expense. Hey, want an extra portion with that? Wink, wink. These are some of the questions that you're going to have to ask throughout the organizing campaign. It's important that sympathetic workers from throughout the entire workplace are involved in these sorts of discussions so that you can understand and affect the entire production process. Not only will such planning make the job branch more effective in winning your immediate demands, this sort of planning should increase the confidence your fellow workers have in their ability to run production without the bosses. Fighting back for our future. When Stevenson College IWW members learned that management planned to lay off 30 workers, they responded with a single-issue campaign. While the officially recognized unions prepared to lie down and negotiate away people's jobs, the small IWW branch issued a leaflet, not one redundancy, and began collecting signatures on a pledge to strike should any worker be let go. When about 10% of the workforce had signed the pledge, administrators quickly buckled under and announced that there would be no compulsory redundancies. This victory dramatically raised the profile of the small, growing IWW branch there and illustrates the possibilities of mounting effective resistance even without majority support. Part 5. Conclusion. Workers are increasingly becoming convinced, and for good cause, that the AFL-CIO business unions are incapable of stopping the current worldwide employer offensive against labor. Several strategies have been tried as alternatives, rank-and-file groups, union reform, corporate campaigns, political parties, electing new officers, and reform of labor laws. While all of these indicate a rebel spirit, none of these approaches has been effective. The industrial workers of the world has demonstrated that a labor movement can be controlled by workers, win immediate improvements, and make major steps towards social change. Our experience shows that strong, fighting unions can be built in workplaces large and small, that workers can unite across ethnic and skill lines, and across national borders. As the old wobbly saying goes, direct action gets the goods. The IWW is practical, democratic, and up-to-date. The AFL-CIO and kindred organizations limp along with structures, ideas, and tactics forged in the 1800s, and obsolete even then. The IWW recognizes that class collaboration is a dead end, and that the employing class and those they hire, the working class, have interests as different as those of any group of buyers and sellers in the marketplace. That is, employers are buying labor, workers are selling labor. IWW unionism looks towards the future, building on the lessons of the past. The time has come to return to the tried and true methods of revolutionary industrial unionism. Growing numbers of workers are turning to the IWW both to win better conditions from their bosses and to help to build a brighter future for all workers. Whether or not the IWW takes root at your workplace and in your industry will depend upon you and your fellow workers and the effort that you're willing to put into building the IWW. This organizing manual is intended to help you get started. 
And that is the end of the audiobook. So I would just mention, uh, obviously, this is <laughs> written by the IWW, very pro IWW. And within a labor organizing context, I think that there is a lot to be said for that. When they talk about how the other unions are using structures, ideas, and tactics forged in the 1800s and obsolete even then, see the Eugene Debs speeches that are featured at Socialism for All. Uh, Debs was a co-founder of the IWW and gave speeches on craft unionism, class unionism, industrial unionism, and explained how the craft unionist tactics, which organizes workers by trade, not by the industry that they work in, was just a failed tactic. Unions were scabbing against each other. It really wasn't working even in like 1900. So they formed the IWW to try to organize at a vaster scale, the industrial scale, and make one big union of all the workers. This was a good idea then, and it still has yet to be implemented by all the unions. So this is one reason for the defeat of labor in the second half of the 20th century up to today. Hopefully there will be a resurgence. And I just want to also say, there's a quote here also in the conclusion, several strategies have been tried as alternatives, rank and file groups, union reform, corporate campaigns, political parties, electing new officers and reform of labor laws. While all of these indicate a rebel spirit, none of these approaches has been effective. I mean, yes, uh, it's been difficult, I would say, across the board. And I wouldn't necessarily rule out some of those other tactics. That said, the bottom line is that the working class makes industry go. Now, the capitalists try to make the working class make industry go by basically extorting us, putting us under such economic pressure that we have no choice but to work for them in the ways that they want. The reality is that by withholding our labor, by doing other kinds of job actions, and by getting organized, both at the point of production, as is emphasized here in this IWW organizing manual, and also, I would say, in political parties that focus on workers' demands and fight in the political and ideological sphere, I think that those are also important, is what I'm trying to say. They are both extensions of the class struggle. The bottom line is the struggle is over basically exploiting people's labor. Is it going to be exploitation for profit or is it going to be application of labor to meet human need? In order to wage the part of the class struggle that takes place at the point of production, we absolutely need much more extensive worker organization. And I think that this organizing manual is a step in that direction. The one criticism I have of this organizing manual as an organizing manual is that it was kind of light on details when it came to the formation of the job branch. I was not expecting that. Um, it kind of just says, all right, you need to form a job branch, but it doesn't necessarily talk very much in a very detailed way about that fairly delicate process, particularly if you don't have extensive social contacts at your workplace or just the culture of the workplace is such that coworkers don't really talk to each other. It's a delicate process. It has to be handled carefully. So I feel like a lot of this manual assumes that, okay, you've got your job branch. It's like, well, wait a minute. How did we get the job branch? So I'll be supplementing this. I mean, we do audiobooks all the time on the channel. I'll be supplementing this with other materials, which are a bit more specific about the job branch formation process. For example, you would want to start out by like mapping the social relationships within the workplace seeing, you know, who rides to work with whom, who's friends with who, who supports the boss, like, are there people who are family members, are they related, you know, different things like that. And you can start kind of sussing out who to approach, you know, who has uh, complained about the boss in a way that suggests that they might be, um, you know, actually open to forming a union. But like getting that committee together, getting the job branch established, uh, I thought that it was kind of light on that, and that, that did surprise me. So we'll be trying to flesh that out, because that's a really important early step in this whole process, which if you don't do that, really a lot of the rest of the manual is not going to be much help to you. So hopefully, though, it was helpful uh, insofar as it was. And like I said, we'll continue. I had wanted to make the month of May more of a you know labor-related uh, type of month. We got started on that late, so we're going to go into June instead. But Rest assured, the other materials are coming, and I have a list of readings that we'll be adding. And uh, feel free to make suggestions and 
you know, make requests and things like that. Share your stories also in the comments. Of course, you know, be careful about, uh, you know, sharing personal details or company names or things like that, because uh, particularly larger companies trying to avoid unionization do hire lots of spies and they do monitor the Internet. So just be careful. All right. With that said, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion there. And otherwise, thanks for listening. Also, thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can support for as little as $2 or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They are also materially helpful. And the patron support has allowed me to spend a lot more time in front of the microphone, recording these videos, editing the videos, uploading them, just basically creating content. We don't run ads on the channel. So that support is really needed and really valued. So I appreciate it a lot. Also, after the content has been produced, thanks in part to the patrons, engagement matters. Liking, sharing, subscribing, leaving a comment, even if it's just thanks or good video, all of these help to boost the channel and boost the video in the YouTube algorithm, helps more people to more easily stumble across this content. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it accessible. We're trying to actually get this out to large groups of people because a lot of people are wondering what the hell is going on and we want to tell them all about capitalism. Agitate, educate, and then of course organize, which is a step that you're going to have to take in the real world beyond the internet. So we'll take you as far as we can with the agitation and education and helping to raise informed discussion and do all kinds of audiobooks, history, current events, whatever it is. But ultimately, it's up to you all to take that next step and get organized. See what's going on in your community. Start with whatever you can. Maybe start a workplace union if this strikes you as something that you can do. Whatever it is, we support it, we see it, and we'd love to hear your stories. All right. Thanks again for listening, and we will catch you in the next video.